Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, episode 63. Coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. We got a lot of interesting stuff to talk about and some things that I missed. Uh, not this last show, but the one before that. Some things I missed on the missing vanishings of like large amounts of people. Uh, some interesting stuff about that. And we are joined, as always... Wait, wait, wait. But... You missed something about vanishing people? Yeah. I have no idea how it happened, but like I was looking at this vanishing stuff and I completely missed some things. Oh my god. You missed some really large things, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Like large amounts of information about missing things. I missed it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I found that stuff and we're gonna go through that stuff. Uh and that's that's interesting. And we are joined as always by the watcher who hopefully is not already in hypersleep. You out there, buddy? Out there in space somewhere? Yeah, yeah. That was crazy. I remember that. It was two weeks ago. You were following these details uh, down this trail. They went around a bend six feet in front of you, and then they just disappeared. <laughs> That's right. Damn it. <laughs> it's six seconds, and it's gone. <laughs> yep. Yep. And I didn't follow it into the woods because there are no babies in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. But before we get to that... News. Space news. <laughs> <laughs> so I have some space news. Uh, space weather news. Space weather news. Space weather news. And it's actually from spaceweather.com. Uh, let me pull this up here. Uh, it's like Kyle was saying earlier when we were talking before the show started. Everything's kind of quiet on the space weather news front, but there's some interesting stuff that just recently happened. And since we're a weekly podcast, we can talk about stuff that just recently happened. It doesn't have to be today. Yeah. Right. So first interesting thing I saw is uh, this. Uh, OK, so it says every night a network of NASA's all sky cameras scans the skies above the United States for meteoric meteoritic fireballs. Automated software maintained by NASA's meteoroid environment office calculates their orbits, velocity, penetration, depth in Earth's atmosphere, and many other characteristics. Daily results are presented here on spaceweather.com. And they say on August 28th, the network reported 25 fireballs. That's a lot. Wait a minute. That was today. Yeah. So that is current. That is current. <laughs> but not everything is current. In this diagram of the inner solar system, all of the fireball orbits intersect at a single point, Earth. The orbits are color-coded by velocity from slow to fast. Slow is red to fast, which is blue. Uh, and they have a picture here, which I will try to remember to post in the show notes. Uh, it's pretty interesting. It shows, like, all these massive orbits that come from all over the place, and all of them are hitting Earth. <laughs> so, they were, they were, uh, so they were meteorite. Or, yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. They're, all, they're fireballs. So they were burning in the, in the atmosphere. So all of these things, and they're all <laughs> 25 of them, you know. Uh, the next thing I have, this is pretty cool. It's snowing in space. <laughs> <laughs> Electricity flows through the soil of Norway. When a geomagnetic storm erupts, most eyes naturally turn to the sky looking for auroras. But during the surprisingly strong G3 class geomagnetic storm of August 26th, there was action underfoot as well. Probes buried in the ground in Norway detected strong currents of electricity moving through the soil. This chart recording made by Rob Stams of the uh, Polar Light Center in Latofen shows wild swings in current during the storm's peak. And then there's a graph here of, with some massive peaks in it. The currents were remarkably strong, says Stams, who has been monitoring ground currents outside his Arctic observatory for many years. During the magnetic storm, voltages surged from 10 millivolts uh, to, uh, let's see, 10 millivolts per meter or 10 volts per kilometer. That's about 10 times stronger than normal. These are pretty rare readings without a strong solar flare during solar minimum. Why does electricity throw, flow through the ground during a geomagnetic storm? It's basic physics. Changing magnetic fields causes current to flow in wires and other conductors. In most places, soil can conduct electricity due to the presence of dissolved salts and minerals. So when the local magnetic field begins to vibrate, electricity naturally begins to flow. Remember how oh, we were? Yeah. yeah. Currents induced by geomagnetic storms can cause voltage fluctuations in power systems and in rare cases, complete blackouts. <laughs> Which is the percentage chance of one. Yeah, 1% one percent chance of blackouts today, <laughs> folks, according to uh, NOAA. Right. So the last story is the storm is over. 
Earth's magnetic field is quieting finally after about 48 hours of a surprisingly strong geomagnetic storm sparked auroras seen from the Arctic Circle to the continental U.S. Arctic sky watchers should never let, nevertheless remain alert for auroras. Earth is passing through a stream of high-speed solar wind, and according to NOAA, there is a 40% chance of renewed minor storms on August 28th. Cool. That yeah. leads into my story perfectly. Uh, I found this at some point last week. Mysterious purple and white ribbons of light seen dancing across the sky may represent a never-before-identified type of sky glow. Oh. While amateur photographers have been documenting the phenomenon for decades, scientists only began to study it in 2016, <laughs> which means it's never been properly ident- identified. <laughs> <laughs> Initial research suggested the lights, which have come to be known as Steve, may be a type of aurora. <laughs> <laughs> Though slightly different than the ones we're used to. A new study, however, has determined that this is not the case. According to the researchers, Steve is the result of different atmospheric processes making it an entirely distinct phenomenon. Wait, why is Steve? It, why is it Steve? <laughs> just all right, all right, here. sorry. I'm just trying to figure this out. This is not a joke, folks. <laughs> this is legit science. <laughs> Steve was initially given its name in honor of the 2006 film Over the Hedge, and the title was later accepted in the scientific community as a backronym. <laughs> Steve is a backronym. Yeah, because they decided to make it an acronym after it was already named Steve. <laughs> <laughs> the backronym now stands for Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement. <laughs> <laughs> this type of light event appears closer to the equator than normal or the equator mm-hmm. than normal aurora. In the latest study, researchers analyzed a Steve event that occurred over eastern Canada on March 28th, 2008. The team compared images from ground-based cameras with data from NOAA's Polar Orbiting Environmental Satellite, which was overhead at the time, and can measure charged particles raining down towards Earth. Unlike a traditional aurora, which is produced as electrons and protons pour into the ionosphere, the researchers found there were no charged particles associated with Steve. (laughs) This suggests it wasn't an aurora at all. Our main conclusion is that Steve is not an aurora, says B. Gallardo Lacour, a space physicist at the University of Calgary in Canada and lead author of the new study, Steve, Geophysical Research Letters. (laughs) (laughs) I threw that in there. (laughs) So right now we know very little about it. And that's the cool thing, because this has been known by photographers for decades. But for scientists, it's completely unknown. Instead of being an aurora... The researchers say the the Steve events can be classified as a type of sky glow, but they still aren't quite sure what's causing them. It's pretty cool. Steve events. Yeah, Steve. (laughs) Anybody seen a Steve out there lately? (laughs) (laughs) They have some uh, images. You can look them up. Uh, They're they're like long ribbons of light. Ah. They're just like these long filaments of light. that. Okay, yeah, I have seen pictures of that. Yeah. Some people have thought they were noctilucent type uh, things, but no one was really clear on it. Now, now I guess science is catching up, and they're gonna call them Steves. Yeah, they they were probably just like oh pish posh, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> a scientist obviously eventually saw one, and they were like, holy shit, Steve! <laughs> <laughs> I thought a Steve was a large crystal. <laughs> <laughs> you give me crystal, I show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, okay. He's back. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. He dropped his electrospectronometer and <laughs> had to put on his spacesuit. <laughs> but now the watcher is go back. grab a spare battery out of the <laughs> outside of the super secret bunker in the super secret space station. <laughs> so, uh, sticking with space, my next story is about the. Uh, is about NASA's uh, Jim Bridenstine, who is the uh, chief of NASA. And he, th- this whole story is about how he's saying he wants to send people to back to the moon All right. to stay. Sweet. Yeah. It, Space Force! <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> dude. <laughs> uh, then it's great. He, he talks about 
you know, how how the moon is like like all the he's saying what I've been wondering this whole time is like everybody's talking about Mars, but it's like, dude, the best way to get to Mars is to start from the moon. Is to yeah. start from the moon, right? Yeah. So he's like, dude, it's right there. Right. We can run all of the simulated tests of living in strange places right there where we're close to home. It doesn't yeah. take you two years to get back here. Right. Uh, there will be different problems on Mars, but yeah. the moon is a great place to start. I mean, right. if you don't I mean, start from the moon, you're a moron. Right, because it's right there. Yeah. And, and we can... So, so this also you can build ships like the moon has a lot of materials on it and you can build ships. First, first of all, it has helium three all over the place, which is a great fuel. Yeah. Second of all, you can build ships on the moon, like massive ships that don't have to withstand the gravity of earth or escape it. Right. So for your trip to Mars, you can build this large, like, you know, low G ship that doesn't have to be, doesn't have to like be supported and you don't have to be, worry about trying to build it in Earth's orbit, which right. means you have to ship right. materials up, to, you know, so you can get all the materials on the moon where the gravity is like less than one sixth. Yeah. And then you can. Yes. Yes. There, there's a picture of uh, a oh, Steve. Yeah. A Steve. Event. Yeah. Yeah. I remember That's people awesome. saying that those were those looked like some kind of knock. Double music. Steve. Event. <laughs> so beautiful. What does it mean? It means Steve. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I just wanted to. Uh, he made a, he made a, he makes a great point. This guy uh, Bryden Steen, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but he was talking about how you know when we first went to the moon, that was like this this big jump and leap in our abilities, and then yeah. like that whole program kind of shut down, and then there was this huge gap. Yeah. Before we started the space station. Right. And now we have this like space station, but he but he's saying the space station project is going to be coming to an end. Yeah. And he doesn't want there to be another huge gap. Another huge gap. And, yeah. you know, it was like 40 years of where we weren't really doing much. Right. Well, sending out probes, but. Yeah, but. That's non-human space non-human, flight. Yes. He's all about human. He's like, he's like, because yeah, the if, ultimate thing is we got to get out there. Right. If we're not, you know. if we're not trying to get up there, then we're not doing anything. Yes, we can send out. Probes. Yes, we can learn. We can send out, you know, cameras yeah. and stuff and learn about things. But it it's not going to gain us the experience of actually what we have to do to be there. Yeah. And so uh, I thought it was great. I just want to read this portion of it. He says, uh, if you go back to 2009, the United States through NASA made a critical discovery, which is the moon has hundreds of billions of tons of water ice. To me, that should have changed our direction immediately. Yeah. From 1969, when we first landed on the moon, up to 2009, a lot of people believed that the moon was bone dry. Yeah. In 2008, the Indians did an experiment, and they realized there was water ice on the moon. And then we did an experiment and realized how much water ice could potentially be on the moon at the poles. So the question is, during those 40 years, we missed that. What else have we missed? Yeah. So he's like, his goal is to... Wait, you talk, dot Indians or feather Indians? Uh... Maybe both. Maybe they collaborated. <laughs> Collab. Yeah. <laughs> We're all Indians here. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So he was saying, like, we need to get more stuff on the moon. Just keep putting more and more and more stuff on the moon. Um, and then, you know, build a place. So so they're having meetings about it. And, it, like, it's it's a big goal for the, for the NASA chief. All right. And he calls it a gateway. Yeah. That's exactly what I it is. I was like, dude. He obviously read Sitchin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like the moon is the gateway. Like how, yeah, just yep. like they talk about the other planets and stuff. Gateway this, gateway that. Yeah. And like like the like in the uh, the book of Enoch. He yeah. talks about the gateways that he they took him to. Yeah, yeah. The moon is definitely a gateway to the rest of the solar system. Yeah, and I mean like if you if you read <clears throat> Larry Niven stuff, he kind of jokes about like you know. In his future history stuff, I think Heinlein called his stuff future history, but in Niven's stories, he has this – the characters have this joke about like when, once you get into space, why do you want to go right back down into a hole? You know, in yeah. other words, into a gravity well. Like, and so he has this whole – like the, 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 the belters that he calls them, yeah. the people that live in the asteroid belt and they're doing all this mining and stuff. They think people that live in holes are crazy. Like you're crazy. <laughs> Why well, live down in that hole? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the watcher's pointing out. Imagine what we could do with an observatory built on the moon. That's, right, that's awesome. So uh, this is the cool thing too. He's talking about the first gateway is going to be a near rectilinear halo orbit around the moon that can be powered by uh, low propulsion capability, like solar electric propulsion. 
so that it stays. So we have a we have a space station in orbit around the moon. Yeah. All the time. And then our stuff can get like we can always be easily sending stuff there. We don't have to worry about landing, landing it. That, yeah. that you have a specific thing, landing pod. Yeah. That yeah. Goes up has and down. that thing that can do that. And then. Yeah. And then eventually build the base on the moon so we can send stuff up to the orbiter. Yep. And then that's gateway one and then gateway two. Yep. That's uh, freaking awesome, dude. I love it. Yeah. And then but. once you start building launchers on the moon, like large magnetic launchers, because then you just like you, you charge like, it up with solar. You and- mine iron. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You mine iron off the moon. You build a bunch of like iron canisters that you can fill. You know, th- think of them like uh, the, 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 the cargo boxes that they put on the backs of trucks yeah right those cargo boxes are put on the backs of they're put on trains they're put on big ships they're stacked up on big ships so they're all like they're all standardized big metal boxes that are just that you can do whatever with you can put whatever you want in there so on the moon you build those you just make them round like cylinders and then you have these large like they're basically rail guns you know, and so you pick a you pick the right area, a long flat plane that that has a mountainous uh, slope at the end of it, and you put these giant metal hoops that are magnetic accelerators, and it goes up. You know, and you just fire those. You yeah. know, and it comes off the moon going like some ridiculous speed, and it can go wherever you want it to go. Yeah, you just wait for the moon to be in the right place to shoot it to Earth, or you shoot it to the space station, you shoot it to Mars, you shoot it to Saturn, you shoot it to the belt, whatever. Yeah, and he was saying he wants to land. All over the moon, like the yeah, everywhere we landed was right near the equator, yeah, of the moon, yeah. I mean, we have not explored hardly anything on the moon. He was like, I want to put landers, I want people landing everywhere on it, yeah, the poles everywhere, yeah, like exactly. we need to explore all kinds of stuff that you know, right? The Apollo landings were. Like similar to, I mean, like pioneering always happens like that, right? You have the first guys that are crazy or they're military, you know, and they go out there and and just try not to die. And they land and they kind of walk around and they either get shot by natives or don't. And then they come back (laughs) and they either get sick or they don't. (laughs) (laughs) And then maybe they make it back and then they can tell you what happened, you know. Yeah. (laughs) And what they learned. And then we can build better ships. That's right. (laughs) We need more ships. I mean, the first Apollo landing, they were afraid that that the eagle would sink in like many many meters of dust yeah and when that didn't happen everybody ignored the fact that that was weird wouldn't that be crazy if that really did happen and so ever since then it was like dust suits (laughs) you gotta just like get out and (laughs) yeah (laughs) (laughs) just push your way through the dust until donk you hit like a rock (laughs) oh i found a rock (laughs) climb it (laughs) all right we need to build airless hand leaf blowers for the moon dust (laughs) leaf blowers (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what will they blow? Yeah. Dust. <laughs> yeah, there was also some theories that Mars might have oceans of sand that is so fine, such fine particles that it would like flow like oil. And oh, they could man. be really, really deep, you know, and there could be life down in those. So some of those huge like flat plains on Mars might actually be oceans of extremely fine sand that like would flow like a liquid. Yeah. What? I, like maybe there's like – Lakes of uh, liquid mercury down in there. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe there's you know yeah. there's mercury fish like, yeah. <laughs> things that swim around and could be, that. but they'd have to be made of heavier particles. And yeah, mercury. Yeah, it would be hard to deep. swim in mercury if it was <laughs> if you weren't heavier than it, and it's pretty heavy. It's pretty yeah. dense. <laughs> mercury fish. <laughs> I've always wanted to swim in a big pool of mercury. <laughs> Yeah, that would be awesome. You could float on top of it. Really I know you could just dive down in there <laughs> yeah. and then just like <laughs> it would just shoot you up. You know? <laughs> yeah. It would probably hurt to dive in it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to wear a special mercury diving helmet. <laughs> yeah. It's like pointed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would suck to dive into mercury and like have it break your fingers and <laughs> knock you out. And you're all. <laughs> 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 uh, it seems like it would be cool though. Yeah. Maybe if you didn't dive. You just, yeah, just do a cannonball. <laughs> <laughs> that would probably hurt too. Just go down the steps. And <laughs> All right, I got I got one more story. This is this is kind of a short one. Uh, breakthrough as dinosaur DNA structure is recreated mm. by scientists. Really? Dun dun dun. <laughs> <laughs> Researchers at the University of Kent. 
say their groundbreaking studies unlock one of the greatest mysteries about the prehistoric monsters, why they came in such varied shapes and sizes. It is also said the team's work will explain how dinosaurs were able to be the most dominant species on Earth for nearly 200 million years. Professor Griffin, (laughs) (laughs) afternoons, who led the research, said they were able to map out the creature's genetic code by studying the DNA of their closest living relatives, turtles and birds. It is believed that dinosaurs were so varied in their appearances because they had vastly more chromosomes than humans possess. Professor Hmm. Griffin explained, We think it generates variation. Having a lot of chromosomes enables dinosaurs to shuffle their genes around much more than other types of animals. This shuffling means that dinosaurs can evolve more quickly and so help them survive and so help them survive so long as the planet changed. And play cards really well. Yeah. (laughs) Wait. (laughs) Shuffling. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Dr. Rebecca added... The fossil evidence, and now our evidence, reinforces the idea that rather than birds and dinosaurs being distant relatives, they are one and the same. Yeah. The birds around us today are dinosaurs. <laughs> That's a quote. <laughs> All right. Finally. Yeah. Birds are, birds are dinosaurs. So, next time you see a dinosaur, you, you go feed the dinosaurs outside your house. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just they remember like, that they're they all... They like seeds. Yeah. They're all looking at you thinking... <laughs> We used to be able to kill you. <laughs> but that, unfortunately, that day will come again. <laughs> but unfortunately for Jurassic Park fans, the team has no plans to attempt to bring T-Rex back to life. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Maybe because they know that life uh, finds a way. <laughs> <laughs> You beat me to it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, dinosaurs are birds. That's all I'm trying to say. They're freaking birds. Birds are dinosaurs. And birds are dinosaurs. Yeah. Okay, so the, the watcher is pointing out that hermit crabs have 254 chromosomes, and they haven't evolved or changed at all in, in millennia. The standard model says they have been more or less static for millions of years. Wait, yeah, well, I, they're hermits. They don't, <laughs> they don't get out much. <laughs> they also it's are like, why don't you just? They're also come out home of your shell. Yeah, they steal other people's homes. Yeah, freaking squatters. Can I move into your basement? <laughs> <laughs> and never leave. <laughs> He's always hanging out on the front doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> and they're stealing them from Cephas. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Right? That's, that's right. <laughs> Cephas and s- snails, other mollusks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so maybe that's okay. Because, you know, Cephas are trying to take over the world. Yeah, they're just, they're just really paranoid. I mean, they already have an exoskeleton. <laughs> and they're like, I need more armor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the crabs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give me that house. <laughs> yeah, they had no need to evolve because they were so good at stealing houses. <laughs> they didn't need to develop a better shell. They waited for everybody else to do it. <laughs> yeah. What was that story you told me about taking the guy's cart? You're like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this. And the guy was like. Felt like he was being robbed. Give me that court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the grocery store. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me that court. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, was it was it last week? Uh, not was it this past Saturday? We went to do the cave mapping. I want to talk about that. Um. The week before last, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so we got invited to it's go. on the 18th. Yeah, so we got invited to go out uh, to a friend's property and, where they've got a, a pretty big cave. It's a pretty s- substantial cave, especially one for just being on private land. Uh, and <clears throat> they were getting some members of the Texas, uh, specifically Cavers, the Cavers Association. Yeah, the, the Bayer County Speleological Society. Oh, okay. Uh, so these guys came out and they were, uh, they do this for, I don't know if they do it. I don't think they do it for a living, but they do it a lot. They, they do it on, uh, they said they go to government Canyon and other places yeah. and they map all these 
whenever anybody finds a cave, they go out there and they map it. And so we were going out to kind of explore the cave with them and learn how they do this. Because, you know, when you're in a cave, you can't use GPS and you can't, you know. And as soon as I got in there, I was like, we need drones with lasers. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like LIDAR. But uh, it was really interesting, like, the the way that they did it. They set up stations, right? So you get in there and you kind of, I guess the the first thing you do is you kind of get an idea. And in this case, we the cave is a known thing. There was a previous map that was made that was not as good as the one they're making, but... But if it was a new cave, you basically go in there and you explore it. You explore the the large open areas real quickly, and then you just you start figuring out okay, so where we're going to make stations, and you set up stations that are basically line of sight from each other. So you have station one, <clears throat> you know, in in one of the they they start in the large rooms, and then they work their way outwards from that towards the entrances and towards the end of the cave. So you like you have station one, and then station two is across the large room, and they where you can see them in the best places and station two needs to have line of sight to where you think you're going to go next. And then they had these instruments. I can't remember what they were called. One of them is basically a compass and one that like would detect, uh, altimeter or something. Yeah. It would detect like a, 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 like a rise in, um, or a a lowering in height. So it was basically the angle. Basically it would measure the angle at which you were looking. So it had a sight glass on it. And if you're having to look up, <clears throat> you're also looking along the axis. And if you look up at all, it measures the angle. And, you know, right. So as you're looking through the sight glass, you can see the numbers changing. Like, so it'll tell you what, and you just read the number on there and they've got both sides and they're using metrics. So like you look in there and you call it the number and you write it down. Uh, and then they have the compass, <clears throat> uh, so you so you use that too, and you get the heading, right? And then the other on the other side, station two, the person there does the same thing back towards station one. That way, you get you get two readings. Like he gives you the heading towards station one from station two, and the uh, elevation change, right? And then they were using laser. They did use lasers and yeah for measuring uh, for measuring distance because it was like way faster. So they would you'd hold the laser measure like clinometer, clinometer. yeah clinometer. Is. Uh, and in the range finder, which is a laser, you would like find a, uh, <clears throat> so the person in station two would like hold a light or something directly over their station. Cause it, the station the, is, the, okay. So the station is just a, 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 a rock, point, a point somewhere on a surface, yeah. either a stalagmite, stalactite, whatever surface that you can also have line of sight to the next station. Right. And usually they'd mark it with tape and write a number on it. Right. They'd mark. Yeah. They use the tape for a big marker and then they'd actually put a dot. Like a, they take a small marker and yeah. actually make a, a dot, a mark on the rock that that's the actual station point, right? And the tape is something that you can you can see from a distance, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so when you're just coming in there, you can see oh, there's station one, and over there is station two. But yeah, so the the stations are actually little tiny dots that they would put on there with a marker. But then you and so you would do everything based on that. So when you're doing the the, the elevation rise, you didn't have to be directly over the dot, but you didn't need to be at the same elevation as it. Right. And then when you're doing the compass, you needed to have it basically directly over the dot so that you're getting the exact right heading. But it didn't have to be the same elevation. Right. You could do it way above it or way below it. You just had to be pointing (laughs) towards the other one. And then you would find the distance and the other guy, you know, so both stations would shoot distance towards each other. And then you would like get the, get the numbers. And then the, 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 the thing that took the longest was somebody had to sit down with a, a piece of graph paper, like engineering graph paper, and actually start drawing a sketch of the room itself. And they had all these little uh, different symbols that meant things like stalactites, stalagmites, large boulders. Uh, and then they would, and then the sketch itself would be a a kind of <clears throat> think of a blueprint for a house. You'll see on one page you're looking at the house from the front, and then on the next page you're looking down at it from a floor plan, and then you know on the next page you're looking at different parts of it. So it's like, so they would draw like down, you know, a a top down view of the room and give a, give a basic thing, but they would do it very meticulously using the graph paper as a, as a, you know, they would have a legend of how, how many, how, how far each little square in that graph was. Yeah. And then they would measure to the walls and everything like that and draw this very meticulous sketch of the room and then give you also profiles of the ceiling and the floor and it's difficult because, like, the cave we were in had lots of <clears> – <throat> what did they call it? The collapsed 
I don't know. It was just like debris from the. Yeah. I don't know what they call it. Enormous boulders stacked on top of each other, sometimes very close to the ceiling or very, you know, or like hanging down from the floor. So you're having, we're crawling over and around very, extremely large rocks. Uh, so the rooms would have been, in some places, the rooms would have been very big, except that they were full of hu- huge boulders somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so a lot of times we'd never, we couldn't figure out where the floor, the actual floor of the cave was, the original floor, because the, the stacked up debris was so deep. Yeah. You could see down, you know, in places you couldn't possibly get, and you could see that there were more rocks or some dirt down there, but you never could tell where the actual floor of the cave was. Yeah. Uh, but there were some large open rooms in there and some fascinating, uh, and they were saying some very, like, unique formations. Yeah. And uh, that one, what do they call it, the flowstone, that huge flowstone, which is basically a, hu- a, a massive stalagmite that had built up of its very rounded shape, mm-hmm. and it was enormous. And it filled that whole area of the cavern. And he was saying, like, man, you need to get back here with some distilled water and clean that thing off. It would be beautiful because it's, you know, everything in there is dirty. Uh, everything in there is covered in clay or bat guano. And yeah. Guano bowls. The amount of clay <laughs> deposits in that cave is is crazy. Yeah. And there were also some <clears throat> markings from people who, you know, over the years, over the centuries, had come in there and carved their names into stuff. Uh, but one of the things that fascinated me was the flood deposits up high in some of the big caverns yeah. and like, look up there and there's, you know, so the, the, in some places the walls were very like flow shaped. They were, they had these very smooth curves and the ceiling would even be smooth except for places where there were like stalactites hanging down. But otherwise the ceiling was like incredibly smooth, you know, and then on the up, on the uppermost indented curve in the wall, there's like these piles of rubble that are obviously river it's river rock and clay and dirt. (laughs) And you're like, ha, when, how, (laughs) how did that get there? So that was very interesting. the whole mapping thing. And, uh, I don't think we got to, we didn't finish mapping the cave, but they did the two main. Yeah. It was just so complex that the, the the guy doing the drawing, um, couldn't keep up. You know, he was just taking, he had to take his time, yeah, because you know to get it as accurate as possible. Yeah, but that was cool because, like, looking at the paper, you know, the whole room that he would be designing would be at an angle, and you know, it's just like a map up, up is north. north, yeah. And so the whole design is going across the page at an angle or whatever, and then he would just have to go to a different page or whatever. So it uh, it, it just reminded me a lot of a. It was like a map. I mean, obviously it was a map, but 3D. It wasn't like a drawing, like you would think, where you're actually sketching what things look like. No, you basically have to learn first a, a whole alphabet of yeah, symbols, of symbols that mean all these various different formations. That someone looking at the map could say, "Oh, there's a, you know, there's soda straws over here, or this type of yeah. formation, and the wall slopes this way." And it's not like if the wall sloped down at a 45 degree angle towards the middle of the room, he didn't draw a slope. He had there was this, just a specific type of hash mark with an yeah. arrow on it that sh- that just illustrated to the person looking at the map that that's what the room consisted of. So yeah. it was uh, it was really cool. But yeah. So, yeah, we're we're trying to trying to learn how to find our way. To the spikes on the side of an ancient tomb. <laughs> First, you have to be able to draw a map as to where you're going. <laughs> uh, there it is. Breakdown. It was a breakdown is what they called it. Uh, the watchers posted this up here. Breakdown is underground, underground rock fall occurring when blocks of rock become detached from the roof of the cave. Yeah. And that was there was this one area in, in the main room where a massive section of the wall had just separated from the wall and fallen over and hit the other wall. Yeah. But it was still standing up. It was just leaning over and up against the other wall. And he was drawing it out. And when you go around one side of it, you can see that the shape of the the far wall on your left exactly matches the shape of the wall on the right yeah. because that entire section fell over. And then there's another hallway to the right of that down low yeah. underneath it. All the way on top of it, there are 
large like stalagmite stalactite formations that used to be joined yeah in its new position of falling over and they're all broken as that thing shifted back yeah towards the wall i'm, I'm just yeah. like what happened here <laughs> yeah <laughs> this doesn't make any sense there's yeah. this, there's this like four inch diameter stalagmite that used to be co- connected to the stalactite above it yeah and it's broken off and the bottom one is shifted back towards the wall yeah it's just like totally yeah. baffling as to what happened in this cave yeah and they were saying the same thing that it was a it was, there was a bunch of mysteries in there about how this whole thing happened now the cave itself was in a rock wall on the uh basically a straight cliff that's near the it's near a, a waterway it was dry at the time but obviously it had water running through it and the cliff itself was cut by water so the cave yeah. at some point had water probably filled with it you know and i was speculating at the time that maybe all that because the breakdown all those huge boulders they did not look new all of them were smooth and covered yeah. in clay and everything like that and so they looked old you know, and these guys were like, yeah, yeah, you don't have to worry about it because you wonder when you're looking at all these giant boulders that have fallen from the ceiling or from the walls or whatever. You're like, is this going to happen while we're in here? Yeah. You know, nobody clapped. Right. <laughs> and they were like, no, no, it just doesn't happen very often. Uh, I just pointed out like, yeah, but when it does, it probably all happens at once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it right. probably probably happened at the end of the last ice age. But uh, <clears throat> just like those walls are breaking off, we need to take a break. So we're going to take a break. <laughs> Not a breakdown. But a break, and yeah. we'll come back for the second segment of the first hour and uh, continue talking about this, maybe, and go on to some other things. from within the cube of science brothers of the serpent podcast returns just so right you guys now. just so you guys know <laughs> go ahead <laughs> that means go <laughs> that last song was called stalactite oh yeah just so you guys know <laughs> Uh, Normally, you interrupt me when I do a long pause in my <laughs> my intro. And then, uh, I know I can have to keep waiting. <laughs> I'm learning to wait. Conditioned response. <laughs> Dang it! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to have a hand signal for that. Like when you're planning on, you want a long like silence. Jack, hold. Okay. <laughs> you know? And if I want you to go, I can just be like. <laughs> 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 yeah, so to finish up what we were saying last uh, in the last segment, that the cave mapping thing was really cool, and hopefully we'll get to go uh, work on that some more with that with those guys when they come out there again. Uh, I don't know if they're planning on to, but I think they are. They're planning on they want to map the entire cave very accurately, and we found a lot of little alcoves and things that we need to explore that, they, that we didn't get to. So yeah, and uh, special thanks to our friend and fellow snake bro who invited us out. Yeah. To be a part of that, that was really awesome, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, hell yeah, that's that's like that's the whole concept of straight to pyramids. That's right, but <laughs> straight to caves. Yeah, straight send to us caves. those pictures, man. <laughs> it's been a, like over a week. <laughs> What's the deal? <laughs> you shouldn't be doing that because they're gonna be in the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> People are gonna be like, he has the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we had a we had a good time uh, doing that, exploring the cave, and then exploring the property. It's a beautiful piece of property. Yeah, and uh, all kinds of good stuff out there. Yeah, caves, dinosaur footprints, ancient <laughs> stuff. It's yeah. it's great. Yeah. So okay, in this uh, so this some some of the stuff that I missed about the missing people. Uh, this this article that I read from Mysterious Universe about the like mass vanishings where we you're talking about like a lot of them were military right you remember that the like the 
all like three thousand yeah. dudes just disappear off the front for Japan and China, yeah. and like yeah, walk the, into a fog, right? Yeah, they walk into a fog and disappear. Out. The the Roman Legion, the the, it, the cloud busted the group of people. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna back up a bit and read something that I already read, but I just want to remind people of this part. Right. So further weirdness came about in the following years when in 1945. Uh, when in 1945, a train carrying hundreds of passengers heading from uh, Guangdong to Shanghai, China, failed to reach its destination, and intensive searches turned up no trace of where the train or its people had gone. So you guys might remember that. Yes. Yeah. One of the last things I read. The only thing turned up of note during the search was for the train was an odd lake that had sprung up from nowhere. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> in November of the same year, a group of around 100 Soviet forces heading for a train station suddenly in- inexplicably vanished en route. A subsequent investigation turned up a camp that had been halfway set up in a fire that had been put out, but no sign of where the men had gone. So that's where I stopped. Okay. Uh, so this this next part is actually pretty interesting. I thought, like, normally on a, a lot of the Mysterious Universe uh, articles, they'll have a like a sort of a finishing paragraph where they just basically recount everything and... Uh, sometimes I skip that, but I shouldn't have skipped this. So he says, what lies at the heart of these sorts of mass vanishings? Is there some rational explanation or is there something far more bizarre than we could possibly imagine at work here? There have been numerous theories as to what may lie behind these mysterious disappearances, ranging from meteorite strikes to spontaneous earthbound black holes or interdimensional portals that open up to swallow large numbers of numbers of people before flickering out of existence to UFOs to even an ancient Greek god known as Proteus. This is the part that I found fascinating, Uh, which is said to be a vast mass of protoplasm that lies dormant deep in the bowels of the earth that occasionally surfaces to feed. The Proteus theory was in modern days suggested by the author Dean Kuntz, who wrote this, who wrote of this as an explanation for mass disappearances in his horror novel Phantoms. Kuntz explains, it is an enormous mass of protoplasm covering maybe an area of some square kilometers, some millions of years of age. It is probably one of the very first forms of life existing in the entrails of Earth or deep in the oceans. Once or twice in a century, it eats people, dissolving and digesting them almost entirely. Deep pools of water were found in the huts of the Roanoke colony. A Chinese pilot searching for a missed train spotted from air a small lake that seemed to have emerged from nowhere. Hmm. Frozen water was found in the huts of an abandoned small Eskimo village. Right? Remember we read about that? Yeah. In 1930, okay, the human body is 90% water, and that was perhaps all that was left of the dissolved victims of Proteus. So that Hmm. I found to be fascinating right there. Proteus. (laughs) (laughs) So from now on, we'll know. Eaten by Proteus. (laughs) Either that or the boulders, right? I mean, okay, so he's got a name, but I don't understand the description of this being. like What, that he's like a... Well, because the cause, protoplasm, yeah, Proteus, but all, Proteus also means like precursor or like, you know, like he's the first, mm. right? So he's like one of the like when you look at mythology, the the first beings that come into being at the beginning of the universe always are formless, almost shapeless, and mm. are not given personalities. And Proteus is one of those types, not necessarily a. It's a god, but in the in the like formless, personalityless, like early types, right? So think of him as a large subterranean pool of algae that, like, an acid that nevertheless seems to have some kind of uh, agency, mm. right? And every once in a while, it surfaces and swallows a shitload of people. <laughs> <laughs> And trains and, you know. And megaphone. I'm sure he was pissed about the train. <laughs> you know, he oh. wanted the one. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that one had a shell on it. <laughs> yeah. God, I hate the ones with the shells. <laughs> you got to pick your teeth afterwards. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting. I can't believe I, I missed that the first time, the whole thing about Proteus. That was really cool. Um, so. What is protoplasm? The first plasm? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, proto also, yeah, proto means first. It also is like, you know, prototype, right? It's the first, it's the, it's like the, the, the least well-formed a prototype. Yeah. So protoplasm. Uh, the watcher gives us a definition here. The colorless material comprising the living part of a cell, including this cytoplasm, nucleus, and other organelles. Organelles? <laughs> Organelle. 
<laughs> so it's like a mass of cell material or cells, maybe. Yeah. Like like the blob. Yeah. It's jelly. <laughs> Clear. It's obviously jelly. Uh, formless. And it can move itself around. Yeah, it's full of nutrients and consciousness. <laughs> it's basically a cepha, right? <laughs> It's yeah. a big blob of jelly that's mad. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Probably has an eye somewhere. If you keep looking at it, an eye will show up right before it eats you. Right. <laughs> a big blob of jelly that's mad. <laughs> yeah. That's what they are. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen one that looks happy. Yeah. They all look pissed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So. The other thing I missed was also in, the, in another article, the one that I read about the, uh, the, the, the Inuit village where everybody disappeared. Okay, so at the end of that, he says, uh, historical records are chock full of, pe- of stories of people who just mysteriously disappeared. So I'm not sure why these cases are in here, but he says, take the strange case of Orion Williamson, a farmer from Selma, Alabama, <laughs> who was said to have vanished into thin air in front of his wife, son, and two neighbors while strolling across his property in July of 1854. The entire community turned out to search for the farmer to no avail, but Williamson's son swore he heard the ghostly cries of his father emanating from the field for weeks following his bizarre evaporation. Whoa. Then there's the astonishing case of a shoemaker from Warwickshire, England, by the name of James Byrne Warson. Warson's penchant for bragging about his long-distance running abilities had finally worn down the patience of his drinking buddies, Hammerson Burns and uh, Barham Wise, who challenged their mate to run the 40-mile distance from Lymington to Coventry. Warson accepted the bet, and within the hour, the trio were on their way with Warson jogging and Burns and Wise following close behind in a horse-drawn cart. The incredibly fit Warson seemed to be enjoying himself, running at a solid pace and joking with his buddies, until he tripped just 20 feet ahead of his friends. Burns and Wise watched in abject horror as their friend fell forward with a, quote, awful cry of terror, unquote, then vanished before their eyes. As in the Williams case, the search for the missing cohort proved fruitless. I could go on and on with cases like the one above, but you get the point. Suffice it to say that there is genuine precedent for unexplained disappearances, ones that even eyewitnesses are at a loss to explain. It was murder! (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) A lot of people explain that one as like, obviously they killed the guy because he was like winning the bet and they just buried him in the field and then claimed that he tripped and vanished. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We know that story. (laughs) We know that explanation. We're looking at other ones. (laughs) I just wanted to say that. Yeah. Murder! <laughs> Someone was on Stash's property. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, I just like the... I just like to point out that, like, the, a lot of these disappearances, the, the common explanations don't always work, you know? And, like... With that particular one where the guy vanishes, like you could say the thing, same thing with the family, and people did with both of these cases. Like everybody tried to say that obviously they were murdered and mm-hmm. hidden. There was just zero evidence for any of that, and right. you know, it was uh, a really good murder. <laughs> yeah, that was also, said, you know, they <laughs> yeah. got away with it, you know. <laughs> but people claimed witchcraft, and but these are too old for people to claim aliens. You know, mm-hmm. so there was no aliens or UFO explanations or anything like that, or uh, probably not even Proteus. I, I don't know about that, but the uh, I think the point that the author was trying to make is that <clears throat> we have these mass disappearances where it's obviously not murder, <laughs> like yeah, you know, yeah. like like pu- the, I guess the people of Roanoke could have been murdered, but there was no evidence for that, right? I mean, there, you know, yeah. There was no evidence for it. And it's like – it's kind of like Mary Celeste style where – or like the village of Ajikuni where people show up – like the guy shows up and there's still fires going or, and food is yeah. burnt and, you know, like it's – and then there's no footprints going anywhere. And then even like, you know, if they were murdered, well, who – why did they dig up the graves? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. And why wasn't all their stuff stolen? I mean, yeah, exactly. So – It's like thinking of, of – just like typical war type scenarios. Yeah. You know, like some tribe goes into some other tribe's camp and they murder everybody. Yeah. They don't just leave all of the useful stuff there, right? If they're yeah. willing to go in and murder every man, woman, and child, 
They usually don't drag their bodies out of there afterwards. Yeah. And clean up the whole mess. Right. And then leave all of their stuff nicely, nice and neat in their stew and their pots and everything. Yeah, exactly. Because that's strange. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Plunderless pillaging. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's sort of like that's the, what aliens do, folks. Right. It's plunderless pillaging. It's sort of like the, you know, the tombs that have been looted. Yeah. And all the loot's still there. Right. <laughs> Only the body is gone. <laughs> right. Right. Because and you knew there was a body there because there's a very large square stone box <laughs> that's yeah. empty. Yeah. And right. it's full of grave goods all around it. Right. But the box is empty, right? And but the, it was because it was looted. And the box is ten feet long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so obviously there was someone in there. Yeah. Yep. So, do you remember the story of the? Um, uh, there was a there was an unopened like a, or an un I can't, it was a pristine tomb that they had opened up in China or somewhere around China or whatever, and they had gone in there and they found that little tiny the ring watch. Mm, no, Do you remember that story? Remember that. <clears throat> a, I was talking about this with somebody the other day, like about uh, th- th- these mysteries of like, and this isn't a disappearance. It's a mystery of, it's a, pl- it's an artifact that really is out of place. Like this can't be here is the point. Like the tomb had never been, they said it was pristine. It had never been opened since it had been closed after the person was put in there. Yeah. Okay. Now I don't, I wasn't able – I dug around looking at this, and I wasn't able to, like, figure out how they decided that. And, mm-hmm. like, it may be that they just decided that because everything was still there, including the, the corpse was still in the in the box, okay, yeah. the skeleton or whatever. So they decided that it was pristine because everything was in place and nothing had been disturbed. And yeah. yet – There were no footprints in the dust. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there was no guy on the spikes on the wall. <laughs> That's right. That's right. The traps were all unsprung. <laughs> <laughs> The large ball, the large stone ball was still in its place way up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah the, the spikes were still in the ceiling. And the, yeah. There were no skeletons attached to them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so they decided it was a pristine tomb for whatever reason. And I couldn't find out if that meant that they that they actually like did like really look around to see, has anybody ever gotten in here and didn't disturb anything and then got back out? I don't know if there's a way to tell that. Like, I'm sure that like... So if you seal something with stone and then you, and then it's covered with dirt, right? The the blocks would have you would be able to tell if the dis, the soil had been disturbed or whatever. Yeah. I don't know if they checked that or not. Now, well, unless it was somebody like you, like if you had gotten in there, <laughs> they, they'd come in there and it's like every all the gold stuff and the diamonds and everything is all still in place and like the spikes are there's no skeletons on the spikes. But <laughs> way later after they've like research the tomb and all this stuff they find like this one skeleton that's just way over there behind this thing with a <laughs> with an ancient book and it's like yeah. <laughs> it's just like dead sort of reading the book <laughs> what was this guy doing in here <laughs> obviously he was after ancient knowledge yeah all the candles and the torches <laughs> In the tomb seem to be over by this guy. <laughs> and he's almost to the end of the book. <laughs> yeah. But he's dead. And all the candles yeah. and torches are like. And then like <laughs> you flip the page and it's how to get out. <laughs> Next page, like the last page. <laughs> Should have read the table of contents. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <laughs> no, I would just be reading the book because I'm like, holy shit, this is yeah, an ancient yeah, book. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, I don't care about getting out. I'm like reading the book and yeah, I get to that how to get out and be like, well, I'll read that later. <laughs> next book. <laughs> next book. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm getting at is they like so uh, somewhere near the the sarcophagus, the box. It's not really a sarcophagus, but the stone box that the body was in, either on top of it. Or next to it, or something like that. They found this little ring. It's a like you know a ring that would go on your finger, but it's a watch. Okay, now this is a tomb that's very ancient. No watches. Yeah. Right. According to the standard model, the the, the first actual watch was built to solve the longitude problem. Right. In the eighteen hundreds. Okay. And not only that, but this is a Swiss ring watch. Which were only made for a very short period of time by certain Swiss watchmakers, and they were kind of a fad for a little while. 
And that's what this is. It's a Swiss ring watch. And I mean, I, as far as I remember the story, the, like it's the actual brand. Yeah, the, brand the, name the, the maker is stamped. Now, how did a Swiss ring watch get into an un like a pristine tomb in China? <laughs> what? What is going on here? Are you suggesting? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a portal. Most people were like, time traveler! You know, but why time travel? Uh, it just could be teleportation. Uh, or it could be the, you know, like what happens to lost things? Where do all those left socks go? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know. That's just a, it's a strange, it's a very strange story. The whole... It's not. It's not explained. Like the, the the tomb itself was unlooted. There was no obvious means of entry, and yet near the the, the sarcophagus was this watch, hmm. ring, a ring watch. You know. Now I, I actually need to check the story because I can't. Remember. Maybe the, I'll, if the box is empty, then I'll be thinking that somebody came in there to get the, the yeah the skeleton skeleton because it was a long head uh, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, they but... lost their Swiss ring watch, and it means it's the Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> that reminded me though uh we when you brought up aliens a little while ago <clears throat> there was one other story that i wait did i bring up aliens <laughs> yeah we oh, were sure just talking about alien abduction oh, in yeah, terms yeah. of mass disappearances and all this it was before alien abduction was what you were saying like yeah you know it was a thing but i i realized i had one other story um it's just a side note but like this guy who was supposedly abducted by aliens 45 years ago. Okay. Um, has finally, like, he's never talked about it. Oh, wow. Like, he, his friend, it was like him and his friend both were abducted together. And his friend had talked about it before, but he finally, I think he passed away or something. And so this guy finally, just like after 45 years of, like, never talking about it to anybody like his wife was just telling him, like, dude, do you need to confirm his story? You or? just you just need to like get this out. Like you need oh, to yeah. do it. And so he wrote a book about the whole thing. Oh wow, I need to get it. Uh, yeah. Is uh, this the one that movie was based on? The the fire in the sky? It might be. I, I haven't read the story since because I there was a it there's a week. kind of a famous story of like friends that were abducted. They were they were fishing in a lake or something like that. And it, and this movie was made. Yeah, I think they were fishing. Okay, yeah. yes. Yeah. Fire in the Sky. Like, yeah. So Fire in the Sky, I've heard. Calvin Parker is his name. Yeah. Fire in the Sky, I've heard, is a is a fantastic movie, but is a is a horrendous uh rendition of their actual story. It wasn't like that. Like it was massively Hollywoodized. But the the movie is good. You know. Uh that's what I've heard anyway. But yeah, the that that story is crazy. Yeah, he says, like, I think they injected us with something to calm us down. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Whatever. But the story's all about, like, kind of, you know, a, a short version of the encounter. Yes. But the book is called uh, or Pascagoula. Yes. The Closest Encounter. Yeah. The Pascagoula. My incident. Story by Calvin Parker. Wow. I'll have so, to yeah. check that out. Yeah, sometime we need to we need to do a whole show on like some of the biggest alien abduction yeah. stories because there are, like you know the pop culture thing. You're like, okay, whatever, like alien abductions. But really, when you start reading this these people's accounts and you realize that uh, that well, first of all, the first thing I did was I went to read <clears throat> some of the people who had paid attention to them, and like one of them was I can't remember his name right now, but he was a doctor, uh, Harvard. I think he was a Harvard doctor, and he. Uh, He's he's dead now. He's passed away, but he was a psychologist, and he started looking at these people who had claimed to have had, had abductions. And like he started out not believing the abduction, obviously not have, thinking it had nothing to do with aliens. But he was like, "Look, as a psychologist, I can tell that these people have been traumatized." Yeah. So he went from that that his his right, psychological they've, they've suffered some type of yes trauma, his yeah. psychological evaluation of them was that they had been traumatized, and he like. Were, went from there and he eventually became convinced that they were actually experiencing something if not abductions they were experiencing something that is outside of human understanding 
Yeah. <clears throat> and this guy, like, it was like him and his best friend or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they experienced it together. Yeah. And, like, after they, they talked about it and this guy, Parker, didn't want to tell anyone. Right. Uh, but his friend, I guess his name was, like, Hickson or something. Yeah. He he was like, dude, we need to we need to tell some people. So they ended up, like, contacting the Air Force Base or something yeah. that was nearby and telling them the story or something. Um, yeah. The watcher point, uh, the, the doctor was John Mack. That was the name of the doctor. Yeah. Psychologist from Harvard. But it's like, imagine, you know, you and your best friend both experience some, something together like that. Yeah. And then <laughs> it's like, if you go out and start telling the story, even though you have somebody there that you totally trust that, also experience the whole thing like people are just gonna be like yeah. oh my god bullshit yeah. and you're just like dude that's like yeah this really happened yeah something happened to them like that's the thing like the pascagoula incident th- there are other ones um that where you just look at it and, you're and like, it's okay. hard to explain when people like because yeah. uh, a lot of this you know the script tards are like it they just had they suffered some type of hallucination or whatever yeah well, how, how they're claiming have- they're trying to make money a lot yeah. of times they're like, oh, they're just trying to make money off it because the peop- these people ended up getting asked to come speak at conferences. And, yeah. and they're like, oh, yeah, they're just trying to make money. Yeah, this guy like, had a 45-year plan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> the Watcher says, if either of you ever get abducted, you better tell him to come get me, too. You're already in space, Watcher. <laughs> if they abduct us, we'll be like, can you swing us by the Watcher's place? <laughs> like, <laughs> pick us, you make me pick him up, too. <laughs> Or maybe he can meet you. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're going to do surgery on me, can you fix this problem in my back? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that has actually happened. People have had like people who have been abducted have had like miraculous surgical like repairs done on them. You know, we'll have to get into this sometime in, in one of the shows. Like the 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 whole thing about implants. There is some crazy stuff about implants. Like there are some doctors, again, these are physical doc, you know, that, that have gone in and they're like, okay, this person thinks they have something implanted in them by aliens. But they look and they're like, okay, there is an object there that they think that somehow got in there. But, you know, whatever, the person sleepwalks or something, they got this thing in their foot or in their hand or behind their ear. And then they go to take it out and it like runs away from them in the in the person's flesh. You know, Whoa. it's that's there's some crazy stuff about that where they're like, they're you know, and then they, sometimes they get them out and they're like little crystal shards. Mm. Yeah. If you're going to put a crystal shard in me, can you make it a skull shape? <laughs> 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 I would like a little crystal skull running around in my body, running away from doctors. (laughs) (laughs) It needs to be able to laugh, too. (laughs) (laughs) What's interesting about that, the implant thing and the crystal stuff, is that if you look at um, uh, indigenous or native, you know, or tribal culture um, legend and lore about about shamanism or what they would call seers, is that seers are chosen by the spirits. Spirits, in this sense, like, think of them as, like, just, this is what, this is what these <clears throat> cultures call what we would call aliens, or whatever. It's the spirits. Yeah. It's the same deal, right? The spirits come to them at night, and, like, the shaman is chosen by the spirits, not by the tribe, or by other shamans. The, the shamans can tell when he's been chosen as a child, and they're like, okay, you're you're going to be one of us. But they go through this whole – during the abductions, they are taken apart, okay? This is the origin of the uh, – uh, what is it called? Um, the Wounded Man. So in a lot of cave paintings and other shamanistic type drawings or whatever, there's the Wounded Man. Like you'll see him and he's like – he's standing there and he's got slashes through him or he's full of arrows or he's got spears or whatever. Mm. That's the Wounded Man. And they tell these stories about these spirits that take them and they, they completely dismantle their bodies uh, and then replace certain organs with crystals and then put them back together. And it's very painful and like it's this massive ordeal or whatever. And that that's what makes them a shaman. And then they're connected to the spirit realm from then on. Mm. And if you go through abduction accounts, these people talk about the, it's think of it as like the same story. It looks like the same story, but told from a technological and sort of pop culture viewpoint 
Like, these are aliens instead of spirits. They're doing weird medical experiments instead of dismantling them. They're putting implants in them instead of replacing organs with crystal. You know what I'm saying? It's the same story. Yeah. And what's interesting is that it's about 2% of the population that claims to have been abducted in some form by aliens. And it's the same percent of the population that are basically the shamanists in these tribal cultures. So it's like there's some I think I thought for a long time that people who would get abducted from by aliens, quote unquote, in Western civilization would be shamans if they if we were yeah. a tribal culture. They would be. We just don't we've lost the shaman. Western civilization has completely lost the shamanist uh, path. Yeah. And uh, it's been burned out of us and by various institutions and religions and other things. So you end up with this. The spirits are still doing what they've always done, right? Trying to provide the human race with seers, people who can see yeah. more of reality than the, most of us can. <clears throat> and these people are horribly traumatized for their entire lives because they have no idea what's happening because they don't have something cultural to latch on to to explain it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so they've built this massive alien mythos because it's – you got to have something to explain it. And these people find each other and they have meetings and – all of them end up with, you know, they're, they're, whereas in, it, okay, they all have massive, uh, they have psychological issues. Whereas in, in tribal cultures, the shamans don't have psychological issues, but that's because they have this ancient, like, cultural thing to latch onto it to explain it. And then they have older people who, like, sort of mentor them through the whole process. Yeah. And I don't know. I find the whole thing fascinating. Yeah, that's cool. I, Th- that reminded me that we we had a discussion and we were going to bring this up again. I know you have other stuff you want to get to. It's but, all right. Um, we're almost done with the segment, so yeah. I'll just throw it out there. Uh, the the black hole proximity theory that we had. Oh yeah. Um, uh, we talked about it again, and like I had when I first thought of it, I was thinking of the whole situation of the time dilation backwards. Yeah. Um, and then you Paimon. corrected me on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paimon. Uh, so we talked about it again, and it was like, okay, well, what if since if if the whole black hole situation was the same situation we had talked about before, where we're basically in this stasis of time, yeah, and the rest of the nearby universe and whatever is is going normal time speed, yeah, then we would be. Our location could possibly be where history is stored, like the oh yeah, the Akashic records. Yes, yes. We, this is where the Akashic records are stored because they last forever here compared to how long they would yeah. last everywhere else. Yeah. So, like you put your library in a vault in stasis, basically, right. so that it lasts forever. Yeah. Right, and so like th- this is why we have all these crazy ancient structures around, and they're ancient to us. Yeah. But they're far more ancient to the rest of the, the, rest of the universe. <laughs> like they are really freaking old. And so there's like like thinking of it like that in the, in this abduction thing. It's like the reason why the watchers are there. Oh yeah, they're just they're they're the librarians. Yeah, right. And then occasionally it's like they come and they deal with the pests in the library or whatever. Yeah. Or you know, yeah, yep. They're also studying like how we're getting along and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> we're the curators of the galaxy, <laughs> <laughs> but we don't so know it. That's what the watcher says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you know, watcher? You're a watcher. <laughs> we're like the Dewey Decimal System. <laughs> we don't know that we're doing this. <laughs> they come through and they rifle through our DNA. They're like, oh, here's the th- here's the thing I need. <laughs> Pull it out. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it it also kind of explains this strange thing about burials here that we this culture that we've oh yeah got, and that, that <clears throat> came from. The, the kings, you know, yeah. which the kings became kings because it was their divine right. It was given da- to them yeah. by those who from the heavens came yeah. uh, to rule, right? Yeah. And so they, they have these strange rituals for burying them with all their memorabilia, which is something that is a tradition th- that's designed for this place, right? Right. For where we are. Earth. Story or history. Right. The Pillars of Enoch... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> All right, so before we take this next break, uh, the watcher threw up another interesting note here. He says there was a documentary done called uh, on patient number 17. Was it called patient 17? 
uh, where they found a metallic little erratic floating in this guy and radio scanning electron microscopy showed that the iron from that piece of the the iron from that thing was almost certainly non-terrestrial Whoa. which you can tell by looking at isotopes and stuff like that and the amount of nickel and other things like that you can tell if the iron came from earth if it's earth based or if it's like uh, space based he just got hit by a tiny meteorite <laughs> 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 fucking aliens <laughs> snakes from space <laughs> Ten by ten by ten, alien free tangent cube. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Kyle just teleported in from wherever he was. <laughs> uh, so I have this other article. Um, I haven't read this one, but I read part of it, and it's basically it's it's talking about Japan's problem with mass disappearances. Okay. Um, it says it's called Japan's evaporated people in the town of the vanished. And this is from the same guy, the one who's fascinated by disappearances, the one who wrote all the other articles we were reading. So people vanish all over the world for a variety of reasons, ranging from the mundane to the more mysterious and even supernatural. And while this may seem to be a phenomenon confined to a sparsely populated or remote areas, <clears throat> this is not always true in the Island nation of Japan. One can find one of the most bustling crowded cities in the world, Tokyo. This is a vast jungle of concrete and high rises crisscrossed by countless roads, highways, train lines, and webs of subway systems. And it is also a place where tens of thousands of people regularly drop off the face of the earth. Not only is this a mecca of disappearances, but nestled within this advanced metropolis is a place where the vanished go. It is a place where they become shadows in a sense, husks of their former shelves, perpetually cloaked in secrecy and mystery. This is the strange story of Japan's evaporated people and the town they call home. One very unusual cultural trend in Japan in recent times has been that of what are called the johatsu, or roughly translated to the rather creepy-sounding evaporated people. Johatsu. <laughs> These are people of all ages and walks of life, both men and women, who suddenly orchestrate their own vanishing, dropping out of society and disappearing without a trace, never to be found, leaving behind confusion, mystery, and concerned family, family members who rarely get any answers. While disappearances happen all over the world, and there are obviously those in many cultures who choose to fall off the grid, in Japan there are estimated to have been around at least 100,000 since the 1990s. Dang. An astronomical amount considering the country's population of approximately 127 million. The reasons for the johatsu phenomenon are many, but mostly can probably be boiled down to Japan's society of conformity, high, expect high expectations, and shame. Here, the group is valued more than the individual. Uniqueness is discouraged, and the nail that sticks out is often hammered back down. <clears throat> for students, they are expected to enter a good university, which necessitates taking stringent en entrance examinations that require studying practically every moment of their free time. Once in society, they will be more often than uh, will more often than not be subjected to Japan's fanatical work ethic with harsh deadlines and countless hours of unpaid overtime. <clears throat> Indeed, the work environment is so taxing that Japan is probably unique in that it has its own word for death by overwork, karoshi, which affects hundreds or thousands or possibly even thousands of people per year. You just die at work because you're you've been there too long. No sleep. Dang. For those who cannot fit in, who cannot pass their tests, or who lose their jobs, great shame can be brought down on them and even their families. It is due to this exacting, unforgiven environment that many such people seek to escape in some form. For others, it might be because of an abusive marriage or severe gambling debts, but in all cases, there is a desire to escape. It is for this reason that Japan's suicide rate is estimated to be around 60% higher than the global average. And for many others, the answer simply lies in vanishing. They cut all ties with the world they once knew, change their names, sometimes even their appearances, and wipe their slates clean, shedding their old life in order to find some sense of freedom from the oppressive society that has shunned them. In most cases, they are never heard from again, leaving uncertainty as to what happened to them or even if they are alive or dead. 
French journalist uh, Lena Mager, who wrote the definitive report on this phenomenon entitled The Vanished, The Evaporated People of Japan in Stories and Photographs, spent years studying the johatsu and said of this propensity for some people to erase themselves from society. Quote, it's so taboo. It's something you can't really talk about. But people can disappear because there's another society underneath Japan society. When people disappear, they know they can find a way to survive. To disappear in a country as modern as Japan, with all the techniques of tracing with social networks, I thought that it was amazing. There are numerous tales that have come back from some of these evaporated people that shed light on the reasons for vanishing. One which, is, which was in Mogger's book is the sad story of an engineer known only as uh, Norihiro. He had lost his job, but was too ashamed to tell his wife about it, so he at first chose to continue to act as if he were still employed. <laughs> Every day, he would put on his suit and tie as usual, going through the motions, and would head off to work. He would then spend the rest of his day sitting somewhere alone, even staying out late to simulate the overtime work he would be expected to do, or the drinking parties he would have to attend, and then he would head home. However, with no incoming salary, there was only so long he could keep up this charade. Knowing that it was only a matter of time before he was caught in his web of deceit and terrified of telling his wife the truth... He chose one day to just go off and keep on going, never looking back and not even leaving a note behind. He would say of his experience, I couldn't do it anymore. After 19 hours, I was still waiting because I would used to go out for drinks with my bosses and colleagues. I would roam around, and when I finally returned home, I got the impression my wife and son had doubts. I felt guilty. I didn't have a salary to give them anymore. I could certainly take back my old identity, but I don't want my family to see me in this state. Look at me. I look like nothing. I am nothing. Another such tale concerns a construction worker called Yuichi, who in the 1990s was tasked with taking care of his sick mother. However, he found that the expenses involved in doing so were taking their toll, and he realized he did not have the means to care for her any longer. One day, he took his, to a, his, took his mother to a low-scale, cheap hotel, calmly checked her in, and proceeded to vanish off the face of the earth. In yet another story, a martial artist called Ichiro was happily married with a child and his life seemed to be in order. The couple had just bought a new house and started a Chinese restaurant, but then the stock market crashed and they found themselves in extreme debt. In the end, Ichiro and his whole family decided that the only answer was to evaporate. Ichiro would later reflect on this decision saying, People are cowards. They all want to throw in the towel one day to disappear and reappear somewhere and nobody knows them. I never envisioned running away to be an end in itself. You know, a disappearance is something you can never shake. Fleeing is a fast track towards death. <clears throat> so, hmm. uh, let's see if he goes, uh, once vanished, many of these evaporated find themselves in whole towns or areas of the city that have fallen off the grid to cater to them. One of the most notorious such places is called Sanya, a rundown suburb of Tokyo that once served as a home for thousands of blue collar workers who helped to propel Japan's growth during its boom years, but which is now a gritty sprawl of dirt, cheap housing and low priced shops, hotels and restaurants, essentially a slum where the down and destitute congregate. Sanya is a difficult place to find and doesn't even officially exist, having over the years faded from maps to become no just another shoddy, nondescript na neighborhood of Tokyo. And this is exactly how its denizens want it. It is a perfect place to fade away and disappear. <laughs> Taxi drivers avoid venturing into the neighborhood. The only ones that go there, they say, are those excluded from the good life and forgotten by everyone, the nameless. That's yeah, crazy. That's, yeah. Let's see. Uh, many of these vanished people have left loved ones behind who often have no idea what has happened to them or even if they are alive, and it is not easy to track any of these people down. Part of the problem is the way that things are done in Japan and the huge amount of red tape overlying people's personal information. Here, privacy is nearly impenetrable. For instance, it is practically impossible to access pub public records, and such information can only be accessed in criminal cases by police, while johatsu cases are not classified as such. Further complicating things is that not even police are allowed to look at financial information such as ATM transactions, banking information, or other such records, leaving them completely blocked off from the outside world. There are also no social security numbers in Japan, and if a first person has not registered themselves with City Hall, then it is as if they do not exist at all. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. And of course, authorities pretend that these that this problem doesn't exist at all. There's no, and then like Japan's culture of silence about this makes it impossible to talk about it with anybody. It's very strange. So. He says, it is all vaguely spooky and somewhat tragic that these people would, should want to shun their old lives and take up a ghostly existence. It is hard to imagine what must be going through their minds or the decisions they have made or the circumstances that have forced them into this self-imposed exile. 
It is also rather, rather baffling that in a crowded city, these people could so completely erase themselves and live out shadow lives right in one of the biggest cities in the world that they could so totally melt away without a trace. It really puts a sinister tint on the bright lights of this mega city. He lives there. That we can look out at its countless glittering lights, which hide within them this underworld of lost souls. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> That's crazy. I didn't know about that and, I mean, until I saw this article. I had no idea that. And I've loved Japan's culture for a long time, so that's... But it still sound, like seems to me to match sort of what they do, like like the yeah. seppuku or whatever. You, yeah, you seppuku, know. exactly. That's what I thought of, too. You get the, too much shame and you have to disappear and like erase yourself from your family life. Yeah. That and way, so like, the, like, we would look at it like, well, you just left your wife and kid and that's... But you don't want to bring shame on them. Right. And so it's like the way they their culture is designed... Uh, in order to relieve your child yeah. of your shame, you have to vanish. Exactly. Right? And then that's almost an honorable thing to do. Right. right? Like the like this... Uh, yeah. What is it? Seppuku? Or seppuku, or, yeah. Seppuku yeah. Is, is honorable. Right. In, in Like if you're shamed and you do that, then you bring back honor on right. your, on your it's, name. It's interesting because like in our culture, it's not it's never honorable to do that. Like, killing yourself is always a coward's way out, whatever. You know, you're fleeing problems, whatever. But in their culture, it's a way to, to like, if you're horribly shamed like that, then committing seppuku is a way of, like, erasing that shame. Yeah. Right? Your name will not be shamed even in history, you know? So, like, like major generals who, like, you know, or, or like, leaders of, of wars who lost— you know, that would bring huge shame upon them and their family and everything like that. But if they committed seppuku, then they would re- be remembered as being as being noble and, and yeah. heroic and everything like that. And that they did the right thing. It's very interesting. It's like yeah. uh, you can kind of see in some ways that uh, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know. Like, would you judge a culture like that that had, had built up this thing about, around suicide as being there's something wrong with it? Or do you like in some ways it seems to be noble it, it like because that culture views it that way, you know what I mean? Yeah, I get it. Yeah. It's like like in Western civilization, suicide is not noble. It never is, you know, like, OK, well, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes it might be. Um, well, it can be, but it's, it's if you're sacrificing would, yourself. To, right. It to wouldn't save be considered people. suicide. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's not considered suicide. Right. Like when a when an army guy jumps on the grenade. Right. That's suicidal. It's suicide. <laughs> yeah. But but it's, it's considered it's honorable. a sacrifice is what yeah, we call it. It's a yeah. sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of what they're doing. So really, you get rid of the word suicide because yeah. that's not what it is to right. them. It's a self-sacrifice yes. for the betterment of their name right which of other people and other pe- people yeah, that their family. have their name yes exactly so it is a sacrifice that's that in their culture developed in such a way where that is a true sacrifice right and yeah. you know in some ways it's like sad but at the same time you know uh that you can't help that right yeah. it's like that's the way their culture is so it is honorable right and in some ways i wish that it was in western like if just imagine if like massive failure made like prominent people have to kill themselves that would be badass <laughs> that would be great because <laughs> like it would get rid of a lot of problems <laughs> right but, they, but, but no culture is free of of massive problems right so. right right yeah the, the corruption the corruption can be anywhere but i'm just saying like that would be awesome <laughs> <laughs> you know instead of having people that are like powerful stay there and keep doing horrible things like if they just had to kill themselves and they fucked up and that's right. it <laughs> Next guy, right? But notice the emperor is God, that. right? Yeah. He can't he can't fail? Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. a double double edged sword. Or a, ha. No. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said <laughs> double standard. Samurai swords are not double edged. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> okay, so. This other topic I have is, is <clears throat> something we haven't talked about on Snake Bros in a while. Pyramids. Hell yeah. yeah. Bring it back to pyramids. Man, I've been wanting to talk about those giant triangles. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from Underworld, which is Graham Hancock's uh, like very awesome but less famous book it's called Underworld, the, uh, the Mysterious Origins of Civilization. It's the one he wrote after Fingerprints of the Gods. Okay. All right. Um, 
It's not the sequel to Finger. It kind of works as a sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods because he's basically he writes it right afterwards and he's continuing his exploration. The idea of Underworld, I don't know if I've said this before, but the idea is, is that after Fingerprints of the Gods, he realizes that to look for this vanished ancient civilization, the, bless, the best place to look is underwater. Yeah. Because of the massive sea level rise. Foot sea level yeah. rise, yeah. So Underworld is about that entire global quest that he went on. <laughs> Him and his wife learned to dive, to scuba dive, and then went all over the world scuba diving in places where legends said that there were underground, underwater cities or ruins or whatever. Okay. I hope my son is a journalist. Because <laughs> so, that's how you can do real archaeology. That's right. <laughs> Maverick archaeology. So this is <clears throat> this is part three of Underworld, uh, chapter 13, called Pyramid Islands. So the first part of it is a quote from Thor Heyerdahl, which is kind of a f- famous uh, Indiana Jones type of globe globetrotting – Archaeologist, swashbuckler, badass. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Redden came long before any other Maldivian. Okay, so I don't know how to say this. Is it Maldives, Maldives? The Maldives. Okay, Maldives. The Redden came long before any other Maldivians. Maldivians? Between them and the present population, other people had also come, but none were as potent as the Redden, and there were many of them. They were not only used to sail, but all they not only used sails, but also oars, and therefore moved with great speed at sea. That's from Thor Heyerdahl. So This is the Maldives. Imagine you are flying an especially equipped plane under an endless blue sky over endless blue ocean. The plane is very fast and maneuverable, and you can go where you want in it. And yet all you see is blue, just blue above and blue below. Suddenly, in the distance, far away where the sky meets water, your eye catches a glint of something on the horizon. You turn the plane towards it, skimming it 200 meters over the ocean with little waves breaking into white horses below you. Soon... Land comes into view, just a curving feather of sand no more than a kilometer wide and three kilometers long, adorned with plumes of lush green palm leaves, seeming to float in a sea that is now not merely blue, but that grades into incredible shades of azure and turquoise. Passing directly overhead, you see an area cleared of jungle, packed with tiny houses built out of white coralline limestone blocks and separated from one another by an orderly network of streets brushed with light coralline limestone sand, so that the whole Lilliputian village glares like a mirror in the morning sun. You take the plane higher to get a better view, remembering this is an imaginary journey and you can go as high as a satellite if you want. And you see that the stunningly beautiful but tiny inhabited island over which you have just flown is part of an even more stunningly beautiful ring of even tinier uninhabited islands and sandbars and also that are also shaped as rings and crescents and ellipses. This ring in turn reveals itself to be just one of countless other rings and crescents and ellipses lying side by side to form a much larger ellipse in the ocean. The outer rim of a great Maldivian atoll, 50 kilometers wide and more than 100 kilometers long. The atoll encloses a lagoon of hardly smaller dimensions, since the rim islands themselves are narrow. And within the lagoon are scattered dozens more small coral islands and sandbars in which the essential patterns of the entire Maldives chain, circles, ellipses, and crescents, repeat themselves again and again. I think I've actually seen that on Google Earth. Yeah, it's beautiful. Like I was... You know, scrolling around with all the labels off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, exactly. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. <clears throat> you urge the plane higher still. Look down at last on the entire archipel- uh, archipelago stretched out below you around the curve of the earth and discover that it consists of an assembly of similar atolls, 26 of them in all, strung together like the pearls in a necklace and draped in the form of an elongated ellipse 754 kilometers long from north to south and 118 kilometers wide from east to west. Each atoll is the product of coral growth around the edges of a submerged volcanic mountain peak. And so here he has a quote from somebody. In a scenario played out over hundreds of thousands of years, coral first builds up around the shores of a volcanic landmass, producing producing a fringing reef. Then, when the island, often simply the exposed peak of a submarine mountain, begins slowly to sink, the coral continues to grow upwards at about the same rate. This forms a barrier reef, which is separated from the shore of the sinking island by a lagoon. By the time the island is completely submerged, the coral growth has become the base for an atoll, circling the place where the volcanic landmass or island used to be. The enclosed lagoon accumulates, its, accumulates sand and rubble formed by broken coral, and the level of this lagoon floor also builds up over the subsiding landmass. Coral growth can also create reefs and islands within the lagoon. 
And that's why you get all these weird crescent shapes and circles and stuff. That's cool, dude. The, the lagoon floors are all submerged today. <clears throat> and this is back to Graham Hancock talking. But at the last glacial maximum, which I don't know if we've ever explained that, but the LGM, the last glacial maximum was like 25,000. It was the, the last time the ice was at its peak before the Younger Dryas. <clears throat> The last glacial maximum, when sea level was lower by about 120 meters, the huge basins within each and every one of the Maldives atolls were all dry land. So you fly the plane lower again, spiraling downwards towards the sea, zooming in on one atoll, one emerging emerald green island. Within a beach perimeter of startlingly white sand, it seems at first to be just thick palm jungle from one side to another and apparently uninhabited. Then you spot a clearing in the jungle less than half a kilometer from the sea. You fly closer. In the heart of the clearing, with a tree growing on its summit, is what looks like a conical hill. Closer still, and you discover that the hill is not a hill at all, and it is not quite conical either. It is a ruined and partially collapsed pyramid about the height of a two-story building. (laughs) Wow. The four-day trip that we made into the Maldives immediately before returning to India on 23rd of February 2001 was not intended to be an expedition to search for underwater ruins, hardly practicable in such a short time, an archipelago, in an archipelago of almost 1,200 tiny islands extending through 8 degrees of latitude across 90,000 square kilometers of ocean. In all that mass of blue water, the total area of dry land is presently less than 300 square kilometers. And many scientists are of the opinion that even this remnant may be submerged before the end of the 21st century by rising sea levels linked to global warming. (laughs) The threat of extinction that hangs hangs over the Maldives and its unique culture serves as a reminder that the world's oceans can and do rise, and that when they do, they swallow up low lying countries and all of their history, with not a trace left visible above the water. And if that is true today, deep in what has so far been the most placid interglacial of the past 2.5 million years, then it doesn't take much imagination to work out how things must have been in the world when sea levels were rising crazily between 15,000 and 7,000 years ago. Besides, thanks to the ingenuity of modern science, we have inundation maps to tell us the story. So one of the best things about this book is that he has these inundation maps. Okay, so he found this, after writing Fingerprints of the Gods, he found this geologist who has this whole team of people, hydrologists and everything that work with him, and they have been getting all this data from all this various different, just all kinds of different things that ice cores, tree rings, everything. And they've been mapping the sea level rises in various parts of the world. Okay. Globally. And then they could, they could, they, so they wrote this enormous piece of software that accesses all this data and these enormous databases of all this different stuff. And they can like build maps of various different eras of where the sea, the shoreline was in timelines and timelines. Uh. And so Graham Hancock gets connected with this guy. And so he can just request like, Hey, so, so what did the Maldives look like at like 15,000 BC, uh, 10,000 BC, 9,000 BC, 7,000 BC, 5,000 BC. And this guy sends him these maps and you can see the shoreline just like shrink, you know, you know, the the ocean getting deeper and deeper. So when he dives on these, uh, these ruins underwater, he can figure out really precisely when the last time that area was above land or above, above sea level. So that's one of the best things about this book is the inundation maps from this guy that he gets. That's awesome. Okay. So he says, Thanks to the ingenuity of modern science, we have inundation maps to tell us the story. Perhaps not still, still not with 100% accuracy, although that is being refined all of the time, but based on the best data presently available. And what the maps tell us about the Maldives is that the necklace of scattered coral atolls of which the archipelago now consists was almost continuous, was almost continuous land at the last glacial maximum, broken only by intermittent channels, bays, and inlets occupying perhaps 50,000 square kilometers out of the total of 90,000 square kilometers that the Republic presently encloses within its territorial waters. In other words, some 49,700 square kilometers of the Maldives that was above water between 21 and 16,000 years ago is underwater today. Okay, that's a lot of land. That's crazy. In my investigation of the riddle of Kumari Kandam, uh, Kandam, which is one of the, the, the legendary ancient now submerged cities of India, okay, I could hardly ignore, or not cities, I'm sorry, this was a, a, an ancient uh, nation or country or landmass. Okay. They call it Kumari Kandam. He says, I could hardly ignore this lost antediluvian landmass in the Indian Ocean that had stretched towards the equator from a point roughly parallel to the extended southern tip of Tamil Nadu during the Ice Age. <clears throat> Even today, 
The much reduced Maldives are a barrier to shipping, but 16,000 years ago, had anyone been sailing in these parts, they would have been confronted by an 800 kilometer long line of cliffs running north to south, effectively blocking the east west passage because the, these are massive mountains coming right up out of the water. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hypothetical Ice Age seafarers wanting to sail east or west would have been more or less obliged to make their way through one of the deep water, one of two deep water channels, the one and a half degree channel, so named because it slices across the Maldives, one and a half degrees north of the equator, and the equatorial channel, which uh, then as now about 50 kilometers wide, which separates South Huvadu Atoll in the northern hemisphere from the Adu Atoll in the southern. So. Rather than the dots in the ocean that they are today, the Maldives 16,000 years ago would have been formidable. If such a thing as Kumari Kandam ever did exist, centered as the myths suggest, on the antediluvian coastal margins of southern India and Sri Lanka, then might it not have also included the great barrier islands of the Maldives just a few hundred kilometers to the south? As I noted in chapter 11, such a hypothesis would explain the old Tamil traditions which tell us that Kumari Kandam once extended into the Indian Ocean some 700 Kavthams, which is 1,500 kilometers. It's an ancient measurement system beyond modern Cape Comorin. Okay. So he says the ancient history of the Maldive Islands is almost completely unknown, and their inundation profile suggests that their prehistory, if any, may have been lost beneath the rising seas at the end of the Ice Age. The matter is further complicated by the presence of an alarming gravity anomaly. Now, remember we talked about this before. It's near the Maldives, these troughs in the ocean. An alarming gravity anomaly centered here. In layman's terms, what this means is that the arch archipelago is situated at the bottom of an enormous trough in the surface of the Indian Ocean itself. <laughs> 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 this trough being created by strong local gravitational fields, which some, may be, uh, which some believe may be linked to the mass of sunken mountains on top of which the Maldives' uh, atolls have grown. Like other gravity anomalies, several similar, similar troughs have been measured in the world's oceans by satellites. It is not certain that this one has always remained exactly in the same location, or that its depth has always remained the same, or that it will always do so in the future. So the ocean just dips down there right. for some reason. The surface of the ocean. Remember when, the, when we were reading... We were uh, talking about the Bermuda Triangle. We were talking about... Yeah, but we were all, I was reading this part from uh, Ivan Sanderson's book, and he was talking about how there are some shit... The, the, the Chinese bought these old junks, these like practically falling apart ships and they couldn't climb the wall of the trough because the, the motors were so terrible that they like had to be tugged up the, the freaking slope in the, in the water. It's <laughs> like, crazy. What? Man. what is going on? <laughs> <laughs> so very little archeology span of any kind has ever been done in the Maldives, but the view of most Orthodox scholars is that, quote, the first settlers probably arrived from Selian not later than A.D. 500 and were Buddhists, unquote. Other authorities argue for an earlier date, back to the 500 B.C., and note some South Indian, specifically Tamil, Hindu religious influence. Thor Heyerdahl, uh, who is one of the few to have conducted archaeological expeditions in the Maldives and whose book The Maldives Mystery is the only serious attempt to get to grips with the problems of this island's ancient history, believes that they were settled much earlier than that, perhaps by 2000 or even 3000 BC, and that they may have played a part in an archaic Indian Ocean trading network involving ancient Egypt and the Mesopotamian and Indus Sarasvati civilizations. Okay, so far, Heyerdahl has not been supported by the few carbon dates obtained from the Maldives, none, or, none older than AD 540, but this, in this, as other matters, he may yet be proved right. What we do not know about these islands far exceeds what we do know. So, uh, I want to take a break there and kind of talk about what we've, what we've already gone through. But like he, the, the whole pyramid island thing is basically like a bunch of these little tiny atolls have these enormous pyramids on them. And nobody knows who built them or how old they are or like what are they doing there or what are they for or what's Dude, inside of them. crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> I have to check this out. <laughs> pyramid islands. Like so Thor Heyerdahl goes through and like looks at all the – what was that? Oh, that was my lighter. Sorry about that. So he goes through and like looks at all these and – uh, and I'll read about this in a, in a little bit, but he basically is like figuring out that like in a nutshell, these can't have been built by the people who have settled it recently. Like in yeah. other words, the people who settled it in like 500 AD did not build these, right? Those were, yeah. and they're, they're much older than that. And there's also evidence that some of them are deep underwater in the parts that were only above sea level 16,000 years ago. Wow. And they're not covered in coral or? Some of them are, yeah. They're covered in coral. 
but you can tell like a pyramid covered in coral still still appears. Yeah, <laughs> it's freaking awesome, man. <laughs> uh, so what's what's the most recent glacial period peaked twenty one thousand five hundred years ago during the last glacial maximum? Yeah, uh, but it's only fifteen hundred years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So like. A, the other thing I think is interesting about this area is this whole thing about the troughs. Like he, Graham Hancock refers to it as a gravity anomaly, but it does, that doesn't really work, you know? It's, yeah, because everything would be heavier there, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> like if it could pull a trough into the ocean, then you should be noticeably heavier there. <laughs> and like, yeah. And it doesn't explain why. It, okay. I think that – and tell me if you think this is wrong, but – if there was a, a, a massive gravity anomaly that made gravity more powerful in this area, shouldn't it build a mound in the water? It should pull water towards it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Right, yeah. Like, there's a trough, not a, not a hill. Right. Like, a, like cause since water can move, it should actually get pulled towards this gravity anomaly and actually be... Right. Because it would be being pulled from the left and the right and it's yeah. in every direction, 360 degrees. It'd right. Be being pulled and, it, towards and it should kind of be stuck to it, like right. a, over top of it. It should be a little mound. Yeah, that These makes sense. These are troughs. So. Yeah, that's a great observation. <laughs> I like that. Uh, really, what I thought of was that depending on... The Coriolis force and turbulence in the water and stuff, you might have a pretty well sustained. Oh, like a trough. maelstrom. Ah. You know what I mean? Yeah. A maelstrom, like a giant, slowly moving whirlpool. That yeah. Could... Hmm. It's a very good idea. Except it's weird that it's over top of this, like, very shallow part when there's very deep ocean all around it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But the, so you've basically got these enormous. Like these in, like enormous ancient volcanic mountains sticking out from the very bottom of the seabed all the way up to where they're just barely below the surface and this coral has grown on top of them, right? Yeah. And all of that is down in this trough. <laughs> That's pretty weird. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. I have seen a mound of water in the middle of a, of a pool, like a lagoon, right? Okay. I look out. I went to a spring... A oh, spring fed yeah. river in Florida and it had this enormous spring it was just like the 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 whole lagoon uh it was pretty big you know probably like 5 acres or something and in the center of it, it it was all about 10 to 12 feet deep but in the center there was just this hole in the rock i mean just a yeah. wide you know maybe eight nine foot diameter hole or something like that and yeah. it just went down 30 feet it was just a huge open cavern under there and the water was coming out so fast it's like this there was there was two springs and they both just created this massive river that was hauling ass like we took we tubed it right <laughs> and just like it was moving fast wow. crystal clear water and uh it when you're standing on the dock at that lagoon, looking out in the center of the lagoon, there's just this mound of water. I mean, it's like a little hill, <laughs> right? It's coming out so fast. It's just making this. Yeah. And you can't, it's really hard to swim to it. Right. Of course. Like you're trying Everything to get, like, away. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get up on top of this hill. It's hard. <laughs> uh, but you would notice the same or the opposite effect if there were, if it was draining down yeah. the hole. Yeah. Right. And now that would create a whirlpool unless the hole was like, a crack going along the base of the mountain range. Right. So it was all just falling into that. It's just and going that, in and it just makes this, this trough. Yeah. So like it could be coming out somewhere else, right? Like, like in, in the world. In lagoon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But the, I don't know the, the idea that there would be a sustained draining of, yeah. <laughs> and then coming out, it doesn't make any sense. Right. right? I don't know. It, it's, it's crazy. I don't know how to explain that. Think about that, folks. But water there are There are valleys in the oceans. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> just weird. <laughs> Trough is not the right word. It's a freaking valley, like the watcher says. It's a water valley. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually think that, like, I, I don't know about this, but I think, like, maybe a, a long, thin crack would end up making multiple little whirlpools, wouldn't it? 
Do you probably, think? Probably. Probably. Like, it's just like... For it, just, just, it just doesn't make sense that the thing could be sustained for so long. Right. Like, where is the where's it going? going? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To the moon. <laughs> Which is why we need to go there and get it back. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Billions of tons of, of water ice on Yeah, the there's moon. a giant... <laughs> down there, and it's just taking the water to the moon. <laughs> All right. We're going to take one more break, and we'll come back to for the last segment of the show. Tribute to our pyramid scheme. <laughs> Send us straight to pyramids. <laughs> we could come back and report on that. <laughs> I want to learn how to dive. All right, yeah. we're back. Let's There's get plenty back of pyramids to, to dive to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The only thing better than walking up to a pyramid in a desert would be diving into a pyramid in the ocean. Yeah, that, <laughs> that would be pretty freaking Basically awesome. it looks the same, but it's blue. It's, <laughs> it's still on sand and it's a pyramid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, picking up from where I left off from Graham Hancock here, he's quoting from, he says, What we do not know about these islands far exceeds what we do know. And then he quotes again from Thor Heyerdahl. Usually the history of a nation begins with a potent king founding a dynasty. The Maldives is a definite exception. A long dynasty of kings was already there before known Maldive history started. This kingdom ended when Maldive history began. The last king was made a sultan by a pious foreigner who came by sea and started local history. He caused all the kings to disappear into oblivion except one, the one he himself converted. With neither arms nor with any Maldive blood in his veins, he introduced a new faith, new laws, and founded the present Muslim Maldive state. In other words, okay, so this is back to Graham Hancock. In other words, not only has the Maldives suffered the incursions of the sea and the usual depredations of time, but also it was converted in the year AD 1153 uh, to the Islamic faith, which led to further attrition of ancient structures, artifacts, and inscriptions. As my old friend Peter Marshall, author of Journey Through the Maldives, explains, Recorded history only begins about the time of the conversion of the Maldives to Islam. As Christians in Europe begin their calendar from the birth of Christ and tend to dismiss all earlier religions as pagan, so Maldivians follow the Islamic calendar. Until recently, they had, they had very little interest in what happened before. Not only was Maldivian pre-Islamic history suppressed, but most pre-Muslim artifacts were destroyed. So what archaeologists are left to work with, in the Maldives, above the water at least, and nobody has yet looked underwater, is almost certainly just a fraction and perhaps an extremely unrepresentative fraction of what was once there. Even so, buried deep in the jungle of islands up and down the archipelago, some uninhabited and all off-limits to tourists, there are several dozen partially uh, collapsed and heavily overgrown pyramids up to 10 meters high with their sides oriented to the cardinal directions. Although in a state of ruin today... These mounds of compacted earth and stone, in some cases with stepped courses of closely jointed megalithic masonry, to be seen exposed under the earth fill, have a somber and looming presence as they emerge out of the jungle. Called Hawita by the local people, the precise function and origin of these mounds have not been confirmed, though the carbon dates put their construction between roughly AD 500 and 700. <laughs> <laughs> Most scholars think they are Buddhist stupas, <clears throat> relic mounds, which they probably are. Unimpeachably Buddhist sculptures, reliefs on stone, and artifacts have been found amongst the ruins, and some of the pieces are recognizably similar to other Buddhist work of the same period from India and Sri Lanka. So there is no doubt that Buddhism was extremely present or extensively present on these islands in the centuries before the coming of Islam. Indeed, a Sanskrit text of, uh, of uh, Varijana Buddhism dating back to the 9th or 10th century AD is the earliest surviving legible inscription thus far found in the Maldives. Still, as a number of observers have noted, there seems to be something strange about this Maldivian Buddhism. Could it be some other religious influence showing through, maybe a form of Hinduism that preceded the Buddhist faith to the Maldives? Certain striking sculptures of grotesque human faces with bulging eyes, twirled mustachios, and curved cat-like fangs may, quote, recall Hindu deities, unquote, admits Arne Skjöldvold, uh, 
<laughs> an archaeologist <laughs> with the Contiki Museum, who nevertheless prefers to explain such images as expressions of localized subculture of tantric Buddhism. There may be clues uh, in Dehevi, the Maldivian language. It belongs to the Indo-European family and is related to Sanskrit and thus also to Sinhalese, one of the two languages of Sri Lanka, the other being Tamil. Sinhalese has been heavily influenced and modified by its contact with Tamil, and according to Clarence Maloney, a Tamil Dravidian sublayer exists in Dehevi also, which suggests that Hinduism was present in the Maldives before the Buddhist period. <clears throat> Interestingly, large numbers of phallic sculptures have been recovered in archaeological uh, excavations in the Maldives, for example, amid the ruins of a vast temple complex in North Nilandu Atoll. I was able to study a collection of such objects from different parts of the archipelago, and in my opinion, despite some idiosyncrasies, they are nothing more nor less than Sivalinga. Okay. Sivalinga is like a... That's a whole other show. The the Linga um, are... They call them phallic, but I'm not sure that that's, that's what they are. They seem to be... They're, they're like, rockets. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Either that or they're and ice arrowheads. <laughs> right. <laughs> the most ancient Sivalinga in India are almost impossible to see. I mean, you can see them, but they're so covered in decorations. I don't know what to call them. Religious like, hangings. And, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's beautiful. They're covered in like all this crystals and like... Uh, draperies and uh, other things, but you can't actually see the, the thing underneath it, whatever it is. And some of them, so it's like, imagine this, like, and I wanted to talk about this. So this kind of moves us into this topic, rock cut temples, which we were having a good conversation about the other day. Yeah. So in India, there's tons and tons of these rock cut temples. And a lot of them are based around Siva Linga. Okay. Siva being a Buddhist God, Siva. Okay. So the linga are these like megalithic things, but they're usually rock cut. Some of them are um, like menhirs, you know, it's like a stone that's been standed, stood up or whatever. Yeah. But a lot of them are actually, they're enormous like columns or plinths or whatever, but they're rough, you know, but they're cut directly out of the rock. Uh, and then these temples have been cut out around them or built up around them. So somebody a long time ago comes in and like cuts out this giant chunk of a mountain and leaves this tower of stone inside of like basically a cut cube. Like, you know, so imagine like you cut like part of a cube out of the side of the mountain and leave just this enormous straight column in the middle of it. Yeah. And then somebody comes along later and builds this enormous temple around that with megalithic blocks, carves it with all these deities and everything like that, and then covers the original the, – the original thing of stone is in the central chamber, and it's covered with all this stuff, and they do all these rituals with it and everything. Hmm. That's crazy. But what's the original thing, right? And when I looked at this and, – and I think Graham Hancock goes into this some, but uh, he's looking more at the mythology. But I'm looking at these giant towers, and I'm thinking of like – Okay, so there are so many temples in India, right? And if you look at them, like, if I was at this giant tower, maybe standing on top of it, I could see to the next one, wherever it was. Okay. And then if I got to that one, I could see to the first one and to the next one, right? So yeah. they remind me of surveying markers. If you were, okay. If you were like, if you were able to cut stone like it was butter and you were surveying the whole planet and you're trying to do it really fast, you'd leave these giant markers in these enormous mountains that you're surveying through. I don't know. Dude, that's crazy. <laughs> and it is Siva, like, said to have, like, created the world and, and uh, uh, formed it in all of its tiny little intricacies and then, you know, and, and like, marked his passing with these things. Hmm. That's crazy. I don't, I don't but I was looking at the pictures you put in the in Snakelopedia. Yes. Of all the rock cut temples and I'm just like, what is going on with that? Yeah, so rock like, cut temples. Let's 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 move to that topic. Uh So most temples are built by stacking stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> but at some point 
in the deep past. Like, no one actually knows when these things are made because you can't really date it. You know, what, so we can use um, – uh, what is it called when you can tell tell when the last time something was exposed to light or whatever? Like the patina or whatever? No, no. It's like a it's a kind of it's a kind of dating type. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Siebelinga. <laughs> Launch pad and spaceship is what the watcher says that he knows because he's in space. <laughs> Yeah, he just posted a picture of the yeah, Sivalinga. Yeah, a small Sivalinga, yeah. They they have – they found these things carved out of rock in riverbeds. Like I've seen pictures of like there's water running around them. There's just tons of them. Like they've – somebody came in and cut the rock out and left all these things like sticking up out of the water. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh What is it called? Anyway, there's a way to tell like when – you know, like like stone – when this surface of the stone was last exposed to light. So in other words, if it's a block that's been – has other stuff stacked on top of it, yeah. then you can kind of like take a sample from underneath the block above it and you can figure out how long ago sort of when it was placed there, when it was cut from the quarry and moved out into the sunlight and then put it underneath another yeah. block, right? For some reason, I can't remember what that's called right now. But The only problem with it is is like if – if it had been repaired at some right. point. Somebody know. took it apart and put it back together. Yes. Yeah. So you'd have to take a lot of them. You'd have to take a lot of samples. Luminescence luminescent dating. Luminescence dating, yeah. So you can't do luminescence on rock cut because that's not how it was made. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Now the last could, time it was exposed to the sun was when they cut it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I mean is, is like, yeah, it's like you, you could. Well, you, the last time it was ex- exposed to the sun was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. And the interior parts were never exposed they have to the sun. have never been exposed to the sun. <laughs> Dude, that's the crazy thing. Like, if you look at the pictures in the encyclopedia on the website, brothersoftheserpent.com, like the the ones from in India, the interiors are what was really blowing my mind. Yeah. Like, I was trying to figure out, like, how do you plan this? Yes, that's it, been my problem with the rock cut stuff ever since I saw them. I'm like, how? Like, there's no modern equivalent. Like, right. There, there's, you know, I was talking to Russ about bunkers. Like, you know, we dig bunkers and uh, they just, like, drill down or whatever, rough, right. rough stone drilling. And then they'll, you know, pour concrete walls and stuff yeah. to make them smooth and everything. Yeah, so we've we've dug train tunnels through rock through mountains yeah. uh we've dug like traffic tunnels beneath the the, the riverbeds of or, or the you know the, the underneath like harbors and stuff like that to get into new york there's like various you know but we don't do this like yeah. we, we like rough drill you know with some enormous drilling equipment or whatever like that can actually drive through the rock and it cuts and then pushes the stuff behind it and then you have to clean all that stuff out but it just leaves this rough tunnel and then, like you said they'll brick it up or they'll you know they'll concrete it up or whatever but no one goes in and like does this and carves pillars that have all this decoration around and then all yeah. these dudes that are carved in and then all this like sculpture and all over the place yeah. and yeah like the ceiling of this one has just these arches like going through it beautiful and they're all the same and then beneath the arch are like these deities or whatever all carved out standing up faces sticking out yeah appendages or whatever and then beneath them are these massive pillars right and then the pillars you can go behind them to the wall where they they yeah. cut all the way back there and left all these pillars sticking out i mean it's just like yeah and the you... walls back behind the pillars the whole thing there are like these these high relief freezes of like all these people and just yeah it's just mind blowing how how you can even plan that like if you're what tool <laughs> were they using where they were like okay we'll only go a foot that way and leave this much for this figure that's going to be carved here right and then go down and then there's going to be a pillar here. Like, how do you draw the plans? Like, you can't. Right. You can't draw the plans on a mountain, inside the mountain, <laughs> right. right? That when you're drilling, you get to the edge of the pillar and you stop. <laughs> right. right. It's like, but they're perfect. They're right. all aligned, like, perfectly. How do you shoot that in? Like, when we build a line of pillars, you can survey the ground before you start building the pillars in a straight line. Right. How do you survey you snap your inside a you mountain? Put your laser up there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How did they make the pillars all perfectly in a straight line? It's just like 
It's yeah. Just, just blows and me And, like, when you look at them, you can tell they have this machine precision. Like, in other words, that every pillar is exactly the same. Right. And it, it, in other words, it doesn't look like something that was done by hand. Like, you can't do that. Like, and, and like, the, the, look, the story for most of these temples are like the, the – they call them caves – in some cases, they, the massive caverns that were cut out by Buddhist monks, like with, that got bored, you know, and had spoons or something. And you're just like, okay, no, like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I can I can see like that that a wall of a cave might be smoothed out, and then like some images done on it or whatever. But you can't 3D cu- like cut giant chunks of mountain out and leave temples that have images and people and sculptures on every and part of perfectly- it. Perfectly. Like and they're symmetrical, yes, symmetrical, and just, and just absolutely unbelievably beautiful. Like it's, it's, it's music in stone is what it is. Like especially when you see the way these pillars are cut, and they're cut in this inc- like you know mountain granite. It's not it's soft rock. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there's the other one that's just like a hole. Yeah, straight down into the top, and it's square. And they left that one of those massive like columns in there. Yeah. But it's all intricately carved with high relief, everything. Yeah. It's just mind-blowing. And then where's all the material? Yeah, the material. Where did it go? Yeah. So, like, in the with the Sphinx in Egypt, like, they, they – that's basically a rock cut yes. thing. Or they, they cut down into the rock and left the Sphinx there. But all of the boulders that came from they, – they didn't just, like, scratch it out of there. They yeah. cut these massive – boulders and pulled them out and they're squared yeah and then they built a huge temple out of all of those so it's like we know where that material went right there's signs of all the material that came out of that cavity that they cut down into and left the sphinx but it's like it's almost like the same people that did that yeah you know that that was the style or whatever you just cut it out of the rock right and leave it but in these there's there's no temple built nearby that has all the stuff that right the temple is there it is there they just (laughs) left the temple (laughs) right they cut this giant hole in a mountain and leave a temple that's carved and all this kind of crazy stuff it's perfectly symmetrical and then the material is nowhere to be found yeah and i was trying to figure out like like when we when we build anything we have these plans and it's like what we were talking about with the cave situation before it's like the way we have to survey this cave yeah is so uh, you, you're so limited on how you can how you can actually do it. Uh, it's like you can't. It'd be the same thing. Like you're just gonna cut the cave exactly <laughs> as you would, you know plan yeah. it, but but there's you can't get in there to, to snap your lines, right? And, yeah, <laughs> and draw your yeah. So you you might be able to say build a 3D model that would be the blueprints or or design blueprints to where you could say okay, this is what the temple's gonna look like. Yeah. But you can't lay anything out right. on the ground. Exactly. There's n- no way. Right. To so do how it. do you know you're cutting straight down at a 90 degree to the surface you just made? You can't yeah. tell. Even uh, like without machine driven modern equipment, we can't do it either. You can't do this by hand. You know. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. It's it, them definitely weren't butt flappers, <laughs> right? <laughs> and like again, like the question is like where the so the, the the material problem exists all over the world. Like the varas that we talked about, yeah. the, the daring qu. Like where's all the material that they pulled out of there? Like in, in China, the, the Longyu grottoes. You know, however many millions of cubic feet of stone were pulled out of all these grottoes that they had dug. That like they where they left these little holes in the surface that became bottomless pools yeah none of the material has ever been found they don't know where it went yeah and, and they had to take it out of those little holes right like all of it out of those little holes yeah you know <clears throat> <clears throat> and then like i liked your idea <clears throat> of the you know we're talking about the shamir idea that like somebody was taking it out and then that was what was making the cart ruts because they were dropping this shamir softened stone on the surface and then driving back to the yeah. bar and leaving a ru- and leaving ruts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but so there are rock cut temples in Egypt. They're in Jordan. Petra in Jordan is famous for the Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. It's that you yeah. know they're down in the canyon. And is that just temple 
facing that's just in the canyon wall. Yeah. But actually, if you look at Pe- if you go look up Petra, there's tons of them. That's that's just one of the most famous ones because of Indiana Jones. But all in that canyon, there are enormous, ba- beautiful, and they don't ever show you the interiors. But if you you get pictures of the insides, they're just like they're the same way, just gorgeously cut out of this rock. You know, extensive temple or whatever they were. What was ever found in them? I mean, was there anything found in them? I don't know. But I mean, I, mean, I guess they've been known about for so long. Yeah, looted in antiquity. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, like, if you want to hide took something, everything that wasn't nailed don't down. cut an insanely <laughs> badass temple in the ru- in a mountain to, <laughs> to hide it. Yeah. But like, but the temple is the hidden thing. <laughs> no, there's a huge hole in the mountain. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Kailash in India is one of the most famous Indian rock cut temples. And it is just, you just look, look at pictures of it and you're like, okay, somebody cut a giant cube out of the side of the mountain and left this multiple multi towered, you know, uh, like think of Indian temples. They're just covered every square, every square inch is covered in artwork. Right. But that, and that's a little bit more understandable. Still hard to explain when you're stacking up megalithic blocks and then cutting it out of that. But this was cut directly out of the mountain. And I actually have started to think that the temples that were stacked up with blocks and then cut are actually imitations <clears throat> of these much more ancient rock cut things. And you look at Kailash and it's like the very tip of the very highest tower is like a lion. That's like standing on its yeah. hind legs and like reaching up and like so I'm imagining these guys they're standing on this mountain that's t- uh, the, the side of this you know it's bare rock face and they're like okay you start cutting down and you have to start cutting the top of that lion's head immediately you know because yeah. it's it's level with the mountaintop and you go all the way down and you leave this beautiful tower and there's lions there and you keep and like you haven't gotten we build things from the ground up you know. And you're cutting it out. You like you have to at least leave a cube of rock for the lion for somebody to come later and yeah and you know. You know, or it to me, it just looks like there's <laughs> the temples, you know, and it's there. <clears throat> and I have some evidence for that. This is not a rock cut temple, but it's it's one that was it's stacked up of megalithic blocks. It's called the. Uh, I, I think it's Karnak. It's the same. It's the same name as the Karnak temple in Egypt, but this is yeah. Karnak in India, and it's the Temple of the Wheels. Yeah, yeah, those okay. massive wheels. It was never finished. So if you look, if you go into the pic- pictures of the of Karnak's wheel, the temple of, of Karnak's wheel, there's all these giant, beautiful, I mean, just unbelievably intricately carved wheels that are just sticking out of the walls of the temple. Yeah. But there's this one section where you can see that, like, all this, like, incredibly intricate carving is, like, starting from the top or it's either going from the bottom up or starting from the top and coming down and then it just stops and it's a flat surface. No but it's face. a like a, it's a, a line all the way across all Just these like perfectly straight line. Yeah, of all these intricate like details, like people and figures and part of the wheel and everything like that. It's like a machine was going and just stopped there. Whoa, dude! I have to see that. Yeah, I like have to see that. So it's I, like I saw that and I'm like, okay, that's a machine. Okay, thing. so so uh, our buddy Archer has this uh, CNC machine that has a laser. Oh right? yeah. And we had this great idea. It's like, hey, I've, I've got this this cool poem, and I've got this cool piece of wood. <laughs> Put it into your laser CNC machine and burn, burn the poem. Burn the poem with this this badass font that Russ got, <laughs> and it'll be great. Well, the CNC machine kept stopping in the middle of the of the process, but yeah. the 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 computer sets it up to move in a certain way and it it's it's basically cutting the poem at an angle like a, almost at a 45 degree angle yeah. going from the first letter at the top left all the way down across the page at a at diagonally yeah. to the last letter at the bottom right and so when the cnc machine would stop it's this like a sharp line. You don't have any like say the first sentence might be completed. Yeah. But then all the rest of the sentences are just Partials. getting shorter and shorter and shorter and yeah. shorter down to the bottom and letters are incomplete. But you can see that perfectly straight line going across diagonally. Yeah. Exactly. Where it stopped. And so it wouldn't if it was being done by hand, you can, you know when you look at that that no one that it was not being done by hand. Right. Nobody 
Nobody cuts like that. You don't, yeah. yeah, you don't get the wood burner and just to start moving in this perfectly. Like you just put a little bit on the S down here and then you move up to the next line and put a little right. bit on the P. Machines do that. <laughs> Machines do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's so great. in this temple, if you look through the pictures, and I've, I've got them somewhere, if you look through the pictures, and there are just – the wheels are gorgeous. And, and to me, it's an obvious <clears throat> Yuga cycle. It's Yuga cycle or, or processional imagery, right? Because they're 12-spoked wheels – and each there's a, there's images in the hub, and then each each spoke has two hubs at either end of it, and it has various figures in each one. And mm-hmm. then there's all this stuff in the middle, and there's this one part where there's just this like perfectly flat straight line going across where all this intricate carving is above it, and then it just stops, and the wall's flat yeah. below that. And you're like, totally okay, no machine. one carves like that. <laughs> yeah, totally a machine. <laughs> and is, is the wall like flat and smooth? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that was. <laughs> Hold up! Wait a minute. Something ain't right. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think uh, I think that's about it for this week. What do you say? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I've got a few things I want to mention before we. Before we end the show here, I got a whole list of stuff. So first of all, I want to mention again, guys, episode 62, uh, anyone who's interested in Arrowheads, go listen to that episode and then look at the show notes because we post like every Arrowhead that was mentioned as far as we could find. Like Kyle went through it. He's 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 good at like figuring out if they're fakes or not or whatever. So we went, he went through and found every Arrowhead type that was mentioned. And we have all of those pictures in the show notes with them labeled. Uh, so any beginner... In Arrowheads, this is a fantastic uh, resource, I think. And we've had other people say that, too. So I just wanted to remind you guys of that. And also... I want to say thanks to, to Clint Beckham again yeah. for coming on. Uh, vast stores of knowledge. Yes. And also that, like, at the, at the sh- in the show notes of that show, you can find all of his information if you want to contact him for either going hunting, uh, you know, or... Arrowhead digs, yeah, uh, and we put a picture of the of of the uh, paid dig, the Mason Creek Four that we went on with him. There's a picture of that there, so you can see the giant screens and the, the you know the skid steers dumping dirt and everything. Um, so <clears throat> the other thing I want to mention, I, I I try to remember this, but I always forget. Like anybody using Android, Beyond Pod is a great podcast uh, app. Yeah. So we both use it, and we tell everybody to use it. So if you guys have Android phones. Get Beyond Pod. It's a great, uh, a, a great app, and you can you you can get the free version, and it works fine. Yeah. Um, the paid version is like <laughs> six bucks. We both own it because we've been using it for years. But yeah, Beyond Pod is great. And the other thing I want to remind people of is, and I've had people saying this to me that people are saying, what you know, what do they talk about? Remember that the promo is in the feed. You can scroll through the feed and find the promo where it's just like that one minute thing, or one and a half minutes, or two minutes, where I just list off all the crap that we talk about in the podcast. So that promo is in there. It's an easy answer to anybody saying, what do they talk about? (laughs) Yeah. And uh, uh, so we also have the website, which we were mentioning earlier, brothersoftheserpent.com. You can go there and, like, you guys should check it out. We've got a bunch of new stuff added there. We have the Encyclopedia, which Kyle was talking about, which has a whole huge list of terms and of things that we talk about names of ancient places pictures that show you lots of different stuff it's a the encyclopedia is like i worked really hard on that and it's yeah. i'm really proud of it it's a one-stop shop for snake facts that's right <laughs> <laughs> lots of great snake facts uh we also have the glossary which is like a sort of a meme library of all the terms that we use like impossible blocks and butt flaps and you know quant stuff and kind of just gives descriptions of what all that stuff means if you guys are if you're new listeners uh the pyramid scheme you guys can donate to us at the pyramid scheme it's right there on the on the website on the upper right click the donate button and send us straight to pyramids yeah Uh, (laughs) also anybody who uses facebook like uh we're not on facebook we don't do social media we're terrible at that but any of you who do use Facebook, you can link uh, shows very easily into Facebook by just sending the link to any one of the blog posts that is one of the shows. So you go to, go to the show you want on the on the website, like get the actual like click on the li- on the the name of the of the episode that you want, and it'll bring up the actual page for that. Get that like URL at the top, and then you post that in, in Facebook, and it'll pop up as a 
like a pre-built link in Facebook. Oh, cool. So you guys can, sh- if you guys would share the shows on Facebook, that would help us out a lot because we don't have it and we're not using it. <laughs> so that would be awesome if you guys could do that. Uh, also reviews, any, any reviews you post and some people have been doing that and it's awesome. Any reviews you post on iTunes or any other place, Stitcher tuned in, uh, that really helps us a lot for getting new listeners. Oh yeah. And I noticed that, uh, somebody accessed us from Hawaii. So if you're not one of our friends who went to Hawaii recently and you're a new listener, please don't die and keep listening. <laughs> <laughs> I know who it is. Try not to die. <laughs> yeah, it's probably that guy. But if it's not, <laughs> try not to die. Keep listening. <laughs> uh, also, one, one other thing. If, if you are an iPhone user, the show notes, the pictures oh, yeah. will not come up. And, and I know you've mentioned this a couple yeah. of times. So you actually have to go. There, there's, a, there's a link to the website in the show notes and you can just click that and, and it'll open the, the website page yeah, that'll the, have in the little podcast app that I that the uh, all I like iPhones come with, there's a little thing that says go to website and you can use that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And the last thing I want to say is what is it? Oh yeah. You can get also like you can comment on the website on any show you want, but you can also get a hold of us at brothers of the serpent at gmail dot com. And that's it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yes, thank you guys very much for being listeners. We really appreciate it. We love you. Damu. Always have. We love you. Always will. We always will. Get back to work. (laughs) 